So. And then I guess if you can, once you're host, if you can just quickly make me co-host again. Okay. It's setting up here. And we're live. Okay, I'll make you host. Make host. So we send our attendees a note. Just let everybody know that you're coming through the link. Whoever is safe. Whoever, who did you say the link to? Tahira, I think you're going in and out. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okie dokie. All right, uh, it's 11 and we're going to start really soon. As soon as the Dean gets in. Do we want to? Um... I just promoted Adrian to a panelist. She should be on now. All right, wonderful. All right, and you are a, a panelist. Hi, Tahira. Can you hear Hello. me? Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I want to see your status. Okay. okay. You look like you are a panelist with us, and it's just wonderful. We haven't started yet, so I'm going to start with my intro. Uh, any other questions? Anybody have questions? All right. And Aaron, we're, do we're live streaming? Yep. We're up. Okay. All right. So with can everybody hear me? I couldn't hear you. Somebody said they couldn't hear you. Can everybody hear yes. me? Okay. Yes. So, all right. Hello and welcome to the second annual Black History Month Readathon. The theme this year is a celebration of Black joy sponsored by University Library. This event can be seen via Zoom and or live stream on the library's YouTube account. Uh, we'll put the link in the chat for you all. My name is Tahira Akbar Williams and I'm a subject liaison with the University Libraries. First, we would like to show our support for UMD's land acknowledgement statement, and I'm going to read that to you. Every community owes its existence and strength to the ge generations before them around the world who have contributed to their hopes, dreams, and energy into making history that led to this moment. Some, brought, some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to migration from their homes in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical in building mutual respect and connections across all barriers of heritage and difference. The University, we, University of Maryland, we believe it is important to create dialogue to honor those who have been historically and systematically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are on the ancestral land of the Piscataway people who were among the first in the Western hemisphere. We are on indigenous land that was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonists. We pay respect to the Piscataway elders and ancestors. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settle, settlement that bring us together here today. So thank you uh, to uh, 
ODI Office of Diversity for that wonderful, and MICA for that wonderful, wonderful land acknowledgement statement. We're gonna move on to the next phase of uh, the Black History Month Readathon um, with a couple of announcements, <clears throat> general announcements before we start. We would like to remind you that this is a brave space um, and brave spaces are defined. They're inclusive to all races, sexes, genders, abilities, immigration status, and lived experience. A brave space allows individuals to express themselves, challenge one another in a positive way, and learn from one another. So um, we just encourage you to be brave in this space and to ask questions and to um, hoping that we open up discussions about issues of race, uh, racism, sexism, classism, et cetera, et cetera, while we read the work of these magnificent authors and innovators in African-American history and American history. So if you are a reader, please remember that you are streaming live and we have live captioning. Please read slowly and clearly so that we can accurately capture your words. Also, when reading, please do not watch YouTube at the same time. There is some um, you know, background, so please uh, turn your YouTube off if you are a reader. We encourage you to post comments through the reflections about the readings, uh, excuse me, comments, thoughts, and reflections about the readings, either on the YouTube comment section or the Jamboard. And the link to the Jamboard will be placed in the chat box for you all. We have backup readers for each hour and would like to express our thanks and appreciation to those backup readers, as well as to the readers who is taking time out of the day to celebrate Black Joy with us. We're kicking off the event with the Dean of Libraries, uh, Dean Adrienne Lim, who will share her opening remarks with us and uh, then a poem by Lucille Clifton. Welcome Dean Lim and uh, I will take your, oh, you can take your mic off yourself, okay. Thank you so much Tahira uh, for allowing me this uh, few minutes to give some remarks. It's my honor to welcome everyone to the second annual Black History Month Readathon. Yay. I, yay! I hope that you will find this experience very enlightening and engaging as we hear the words of creative and passionate Black voices through words that will celebrate historical and contemporary moments of joy. I'm sure that I can speak for all of my library colleagues when I say that we appreciate the fact that you are here with us and willing to do the work. In this case, I hope extremely enjoyable work to listen and reflect on black joy through poetry and prose, especially in this season of social change and polarization of worldviews. It's even more important, I think, for us to come together as a community and to consider the ways that black voices can inform our lives, our work and our thinking. Having said this, I also know that an event like this would not be possible without the commitment and hard work of the library's inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, also known as IDEA committee, and our partners at the Office of Multicultural Involvement and Community Advocacy. Sincere thanks to all of you and to all those who helped. If I read the names, I would be here for many more minutes than, than you'd like me to, to be. Uh, but for all of you who do this work to create a more inclusive culture and environment for our students, staff, and faculty, and our community members at the University of Maryland. Now, if you'll indulge me, I'll end my brief remarks with a poem by Lucille Clifton entitled, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Won't You Celebrate With Me by Lucille Clifton. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight to my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. And now I hope that everyone involved and present today can stay, speak out and celebrate here 
and away. Thank you. Thank you, Dee Lynn, for those wonderful words. Um, so right now, we're going to um, move forward with the programming. Uh, so I have a wonderful video to show you all. We're going to kick this off with our poet laureate, Amanda Gorman, and her speech, uh, her poem, excuse me, The Hill We Climb, just a wonderful, wonderful piece. And we wanted to uh, start off with that piece of beautiful poetry as a way to uh, open our hearts and minds and then the catalyst for what we hope for uh, is change. So I'm going to go ahead and start uh, the video with um, Amanda Gorman, uh, who I want to be like when I grow up. So. Uh, Tahira, there's no sound coming through. Tahira, there's no sound coming through. I think there's no sound still. Okay, so apologies, we're having some technical difficulties. Um, the video, you all don't hear the sound, is that correct? That is correct, we don't hear any sound. Okay, all right, so we'll come back to that. I don't understand why the sound is not working. Uh, so we'll come back to it. And let's go ahead and roll on to our next presenter, okay? All right, so uh, any questions so far? All right, let's move it along and we'll see if we can show that later if we troubleshoot that. Uh, let's go here. And uh, so we are going to kick, kick this off with our first reader. Um, and that person is going to be Alexis Williams. And we're going to see if she is in our waiting room, ready to go. Attendees. Yes, she is. So. Hello, Alexis. Hi, Tahira. How are, How are you? you? It's so good to be here. <laughs> it's so nice to have you. You are amazing. So um, I am going to cede the floor to you to do your magnific magnificent poem. And uh, do you want to introduce yourself and the poem, Dr. Williams? Sure. I'm Alexis Williams. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me, but if you, you can, can I apologize. Okay. Okay. 
Um, I don't know if, is it supposed to show my video? I'm not in control of it. So if you can, you can probably see my dog in the background at some point. I just want to apologize for that. Um, but I <laughs> have uh, been, a, I guess, a, a person, a Let's see. And uh, now we try see. To... Hello. Yay. Yay. Hi. <laughs> I was afraid I might be on camera. You didn't have to show me. I was just saying, like, okay. in case you could see me. <laughs> you look gorgeous. Gorgeous. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, my mom uh, was a student at University of Maryland for her master's in library science, oh which we found out um, when we were working with Tahira um, with the uh, Diversity Immersion Institute in, was Thank it 2016? Yes, um, and so I I will, I shared her story and she shared, she shared her story with all of us because I didn't even know about it. But she had all of these books, and one of them is um, Tales Told Near a Crocodile. It might be backwards, so I apologize. Um, by Humphrey Harmon. I tried to do a little bit of background on him, but I couldn't find anything <laughs> except for a couple of other books that he's read, um, uh, written, sorry, about um, just like different parts of what he calls like stories from Nyanza. And I'm going to mispronounce stuff. So at the end, please um, correct me if you know any of the correct pronunciations of these. But I guess I'll, uh, I, I guess since my mom has been associated with the campus, she brought me when she was doing her master's when I was like two years old to, to the Keldon Library. And then I accidentally ended up going to University of Maryland uh, for undergrad and grad school. And I teach at Maryland whenever possible. Um, I work there. So I am heavily committed to um, just the, the life and the history of our campus. And I know that Black history is our campus history. So I'm so excited to be able to read this. I, I also always wanted to be a reader. Like I used to go to the library and listen to the readers when I was a kid. So <laughs> this is like you're, my dream you're country. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so the um, short story that, should I just go ahead and get started? Yes, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, and I lose track of time. So you might have to like, just go ahead and mute me when it's done. Uh, five minutes is done, but this we'll let you story- know. We'll, we'll let you know when you have uh, uh, um, 30 seconds left, okay? Awesome. All right. And um, this one story I love the most out of all of these because I believe it's the first documented case of ADHD <laughs> without it being one and possibly like mild uh, narcolepsy type one. <laughs> but anyway, the story is called, uh, if you can see it backwards, on Songo and the Maasai cattle. Uh, it's a very long story, so I won't get through it all, but it's just beautiful. Uh, so here we go. Akinyi was a woman of the Kisi people, and she lived with her three sons high in the hills on the other side of the Great Lake. Um, by the way, they call it Nyanza, now it's called Lake Victoria, if anyone knows it. Um, her house was perched on a hilltop and 500 feet below it was the stream from which each day she fetched her household water striding upright with the heavy pot on her head and the walk of a hill woman. On either side of the stream were Akinyi's gardens arranged in terraced steps. And here she grew her sweet potatoes and beans, her finger millet and maize and the tiny sweet bananas called ladies' fingers. Behind the house rose up the great Kisi mountain where no one lives because it is made of iron and the lightning strikes there more than any place in the world. But below it, the land dropped away and away, dotted with the farms of her people down to the great lake. In the morning, everything would seem so clear and near that you might believe you could throw a stone on the roof of a house five miles away of course you couldn't, but when the sun was high and everything made of polished brass, they all vanished in the heat and you might've been standing on the edge of the world. Akinyi was a widow. Her husband had been killed by a leopard who had come in the night and stolen a goat. The man had taken a spear and gone out in the morning and never come home alive again. 
But the leopard skin hung in a king's house and there were three great spear holes in it. So then Akinyi and her sons uh, had her sons to look after because she had not bothered to marry again. And although she worked hard in her garden, they remained poor. The three brothers were called Onsango, the eldest, Otinga and Opio. And when they were small, they were as like as puppies in a basket. But when they were older, they grew apart. Otinga and Opio were good Kisi'i boys with deep chests and muscly legs. It comes from running up and down hills. And they herded their mother's tiny flock of goats and practiced throwing spears with the other boys and told, and the old Kisi'i men looked at them with approval. Eh, a handsome pair, they said. It's a pity the family's so poor. With a good herd of cattle to help, either boy would make a fine son-in-law. Well, it's servants of richer men they'll have to be all their lives. And then, of course, there's the eldest, Onsongo. It's hard what some folks have to put up with. And then, of course, there was Onsongo. He was fat and sleepy, and they said he was lazy. Perhaps he was. Certainly, the things he did drove poor Akinyi to despair. Send him to weed a garden and you'd find him sitting in the shade playing with a bit of clay he had scooped out of the stream and the whole lining in the beans and not a thing done. When his mother screamed at him, he'd look up with placid sleepy eyes and say, yeah, I'm sorry, mother, I forgot. Forgot? How can one forget to weed a garden when you're sitting in it? Send him to watch the goats and you'd find him scraping away at a bit of wood with his knife and the goats eating a neighbor's young corn. I'm sorry, mother, I forgot. Then Akinyi would lose all patience and take a little stick to improve his memory, but it never did much good. And afterwards, she would feel sorry and cry and say, Onsongo, Onsongo, aren't things difficult enough without you behaving like this? And Onsongo would be sorry. He really was, and promised to try and do better and mean it because he loved his mother and he would set off with the best of intentions until, until he forgot again. He was hopeless. The other children made up teasing songs about Unsongo in the way that Africans do, that is all together on the spur of the moment and never write them down. It's the best way to do it because only the good ones get remembered. A group of them would find him sleeping in the grass. They would gather around on tiptoe and sing softly over the body, answering each other. Is Otinga here? He's away on the hillside. Is Opio here? He's below in the valley. Well, is Onsongo here? Shh. Is he asleep or awake? Shh, asleep. See how he curls in the grass like a hyrax? A spider has made a web between his toes. Tell him the buck are in his garden. He yawns. Tell him the rats are in the store. He sighs. Tell him his house is burnt down. He's, is he? Yes, he's asleep again. Oh, how shall we make our dear friend on Sango wake up? It would finish, as you see, with a great shout and screams of laughter. And on Sango would wake up with a jump and stare. And then this was the nicest thing about him. He would smile and wander away absentmindedly, not in the smallest bit angry. How you, you, have doing? you have 30 seconds. Okay, uh, I'll read one more paragraph. Ansungo okay. was not really lazy, or rather, not always lazy. His trouble was that he only could do the things he liked doing, and that was what he called, um, that, that was what he called work serious people called play. He was, in fact, an artist. And it goes on, this is a long story, but I love it so much. <laughs> it thank reminds you. me of me so <laughs> yeah thank yes, you so much thank you that's so it's beautiful why was that, so why was that piece um, 
talk about your mom and family, but near and dear to your heart. So right now I'm sitting in my uncle's house. This is, um, my uncle passed away in 2004 when I was just getting started with graduate school. And um, there were a lot of, uh, I guess, things about his house that were happy memories for me. And I had uh, talked to my mom about keeping the house and the family after he died. And so I think this was one of the books that he had here that is now back in the house. <laughs> so it's either his book that, I don't know if my mom had given it to him or if he had gotten it from somewhere, but it's from, you can see there's a stamp in it from Timbuktu Market of New Africa, uh, 462 Mitchell Street, Southwest Atlanta, Georgia, 30313. Um, and so this book has traveled around a lot and uh, it, it was just in our family, just sitting around collecting dust. But when I finally read it, I couldn't put it down. Um, ooh, how does the story end? Oh uh, boy. So he, he basically ends up helping his family in a way that only he can with exactly the way that he is. And he ends up, it's kind of like, almost like one of those happily ever after stories, but it's, it's such a beautiful story of how with, yes, Humphrey Harmon, um, with how he has, um, I guess these qualities and skills that people don't value and no one really sees the purpose of like the way that he is. They just see it as a drawback but in the ways that he is able to think and just like challenge himself and express himself, that's exactly how he ends up helping his community. So it reminds me of myself. It reminds me of my family. It's a, you know, this book has been in our family for I don't know how long. And I just love the, the stories that are told in it. It's also a story of strength that um, you don't really hear a lot told about different parts of Africa. So it covers, um, the areas around uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And it's just beautiful. Thank you so much, Alexis. That was a beautiful piece. Really appreciate that. And also the context you gave us for your coming to understand. So much appreciated. You are amazing. I appreciate you, appreciate you being here. And I hope you can stick around to see uh, our other presenters. I'll be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You take care of yourself. You too. Thank you. And hello, how are you? Can you, hello? Hi. I yeah, think, hi. yeah, there we go. Yeah, can you, like, is my audio and video working? Yes, I can definitely hear hey. you. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing good, how are you? Okay, so I am um, going to pronounce your name and please correct me because I was practicing, okay? It's kind of like my name is Tahira and that thing gets butchered all the time. So um, is it Amitava Banjni? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I did it! <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for joining us for the uh, second annual Black History Month Readathon. And you want to tell us a little bit about your piece that you're going to read for us today? Okay, uh, thank you. And um, hello, everyone. I am Amitava Banerjee, and my pronouns are he, him, or they, them. And I am a graduate student from the physics department. And I'll be reading the article called A Black Lives Matter Bedtime Story by Dr. Chanda Prisco Doenstein. Uh, and so, okay, thank you. And, and I'm, you have five minutes, and I'll let you know at the 30 second mark, okay? okay? All okay. Right, so, wonderful. can I put the link to this article in the chat? So yeah, sure. It's easier to do the questions. Then we also have a question and answer. You can stick it either one. A link in the chat and I'll be reading for this article. So some brief introduction first. Dr. Presko Doenstein, pronounced she, her, is a cosmologist and feminist theorist and a faculty member at the departments of physics and women's studies at the University of New Hampshire. Please stay tuned for her forthcoming popular science book titled The Disordered Cosmos that draws from her experience and knowledge as a black woman theoretical physicist. The article that I am going to read now is a celebration of black lives in the context of the 14 billion years of history of her universe itself. And it explains 
how black lives are star stuff. And I already put the link to the article in the chat and I, I'll also make occasional comments in the middle of my reading so that some of the relatively technical terms used in this article become clear. Once upon a time, there was a universe. We are not super sure about how it started or whether there is a reason. We are pretty sure in the first 10 to the minus 43 seconds, it expanded very rapidly so that for the most part, it looked the same in every direction and looked the same no matter where you are standing. So by the way, 10 to the minus 43 seconds is a very small time. As you see, it's like smaller than a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a millionth of a second. But as the author tells us, this was the very small time our universe required to look the same everywhere and in every direction. So, reading on, except that also particles started to blip due to quantum fluctuations, maybe in space-time. We are still not super sure about that. Then, again, we are not super sure about this. For some reason, those particles formed more particle-type matter called baryons than antibaryons. That's called baryogenesis. Now, you must be thinking that these so-called baryons are some exotic particles of the universe, but no. It is only a fancy name of the basic constituents of all atoms, like protons, neutrons, and the likes. They are the baryons. So our bodies are made up of these baryons. This is the particle that makes up our body. Uh, from there, those baryons started to form structures. And from the structures, stars formed. Then the stars got old, and some of them died in super epic rather fabulous fashion, they exploded into supernovae in the process, making heavy elements like carbon and oxygen. Those elements would go on to the basis for all life on Earth. Earth is a planet, one of the structures that formed from stars and the leftovers of supernovae. Eventually, on Earth, a smaller type of structure that we call life, Formed. Some of the life forms that evolved were relatively hairless apes that used a variety of methods of communication. There are about 7 billion of these apes with various levels of eumelanin in their skin, which gives their skin color. They also have a lot of different hair textures. Some of the ones with less eumelanin have, for a long time now, been cruel to the ones with more. We are not super sure about why this is, but it might be due to laziness and or because they are jealous of our boogie. But despite this, black lives come from the same baryogenesis, the same supernovae, and the same structure formation. No matter what the lowest eumelanin people say, black lives are star stuff and Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Amitabana. Amit Ow, I, uh, Amitabha. Did I do it right? Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. So um, the reading, thank you for the Black Lives Matter reading. Now, so uh, what drew you to that reading and why did you select that particular one? Uh, so, so first of all, I am a physics graduate student. So something with physics I can easily connect to. And I also saw that like not many people are talking about um, the joy of black scientists in this panel, since this is a theme of black joy. And to me personally, I feel that the greatest joy is in knowing that your, your body is made up of the same thing as the stars, because that gives you a sense of belongingness in this universe. I think that's the greatest joy. Yeah, no, that was really cool. I like that. Um, and I, I've heard that somewhere before. Uh, I really get into when people give that different perspective about our humanity and about how wonderful we all are in this collective human family. So that particular one definitely uh, goes to the heart of, of all communities, Black communities, uh, 
and just the fact that you are more than your body and, and, and your spirit, you are really something of a celestial realm, right? And if we acknowledge that and um, gave, cre you know, respect to that, we would treat each other better, I feel, I think, I hope, <laughs> I hope. Um, some do, some don't, but we're working toward that. So uh, thank you so much for that reading. That was thank really you. awesome. Appreciate you and hope you can stick around to see some other readings and maybe ask some questions in chat. If you all have questions, please go ahead and put in the question and answer and chat, okay? All right, so thank you so much. Appreciate it and have a wonderful day. Awesome. All right, so um, I'm gonna try again to um, show that video. Let's see, second, third time to charm. Can I do it? Can I do it? I think I can. All right, so um, let's see, change. I'm gonna change the status really quick and then we're gonna move on. All right, so let's try the uh, Amanda Gorman video. Let's try that and we're running a little behind, but uh, I wanna really want that to set us up. We had two great readings a minute ago by Alexis, Alexis Williams and uh, Amadwa Banachichi. Bon and so uh, we're going to do Amanda Gorman right now. And let's just hope we can see that beautiful presentation. All right. So give me a minute and I will go and change our screen. All right. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promised glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it, because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a forest that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. In this effort, in, Madam Vice President, Mr. Emhoff, Americans and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. 
If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promised glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it, because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a forest that would shatter our nation rather than share it, would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at in its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe. Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? Mm. We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce, and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens. But one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than one we we're left with every breath from my bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the wind swept northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked south. We will rebuild reconcile and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid, the new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Wow. So uh, that was Amanda Gorman, as you all know, um, who is a youth court laureate. And uh, I just, that piece was just powerful. Um, I don't know if my other colleagues, Cindy and Jody, have anything to say about it, but what it reminded me of always that we're in an experiment uh, in this country called our government and that we all have to contribute. We all have to understand what it means to live in a democracy and appreciate it. Also that we are one people. And that just, uh, you know, been resonating, you know, throughout. Um, people are always saying that we are one people, but to really understand that and embrace it and to believe in it, your actions will change once you know that we're a part of the human family. And so all of us. And so I love that piece for that. It was just, uh, well, the myriad of things, but particularly for that, um, coming back home to that, the connection that we all share um, as humans. And so um, anybody else want to comment on that before we move on to our next person? Our next reader. Uh, hey, Tahira, this is Cindy. And um, I just love that that message comes in from this young Black woman who gives us the most powerful words to think about. And I, I just think that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I'd just like to add, too, I think you know, occasionally there's like these moments where somebody writes something or or gives a speech and, you know, it's remembered for decades as sort of like embodying a moment and a feeling. And 
I think she, she did it. I mean, like she really did. Like when I listen to that, and I, sorry, every time I listen to that, I kind of get these like tears in my eyes, you know, and it's something that I'm going to tell my, you know, nieces and nephews about decades from now, like you were alive, you listened to that on TV, but it's like, it's still here, right? Like it's, it's still, and it's just, I think it's one of those like really, really powerful em, embodying poems that, that is going to like last for a really long time. It, it, it just feels timeless. Thank you. It really does. And I, I, you know, we only hope for the, you know, when we can look back and say things have gotten better. That's our goal, right? What uh, we've done better in this generation for the generation ahead. And so um, thank you, Jody. And we have uh, Beth Gay with us right now. And Beth, uh, you are. Hey, Beth. How are you? Hi, Tara. I'm Hi, good. How, how are you? Pretty good. Just trying to make sure the thing you know, it's moving along pretty good. And so we had some really great readers um, um, the first uh, hour and you were going to cap off our hour with your wonderful reading. And so you wanna tell us a little bit about your selection and why you chose to read it? Well, um, I, I'm going to read a couple of um, passages from Maya Angelou, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Uh, which is one of my very favorite books. Um, and there's a lot going on in this book, but uh, I wrote something down that Amanda Gorman said that kind of struck me that had to do with Maya Angelou. And um, she said, being American, I don't know, but is about the past we step into. And that is what um, Maya Angelou does in this work of autobiographical fiction. Um, and I, I, I'm grateful I read that it was autobiographical fiction on um, Wikipedia and I'm grateful for the fiction. I'm grateful for the autobiography. The, she, I just love the poetry that comes from her. Uh, and about the passages I'm going to read in, in chapters one and three, um, it's go, she's reflecting on her youth, but she's reflecting on her childhood when she um, was, uh, her parents separated and she was sent home to live with her um, grandmother in Stamps, Arkansas. And um, I just got, this theme is black joy. Oh, and that's what this book does. But I just want to say, if I go a little bit over five minutes, that I I might because I'm gonna try my best okay, to so, um, not to. Okay, so we'll we'll give a little wiggle room. We're running behind, but we'll give you some wiggle room. So you go ahead and start the reading, and then we'll look at the time. You know, as we go forward. Thank you. You're welcome. When I was three. Thank you, Tahira. When I was three and Bailey four, we had arrived in the musty little town wearing tags on our wrists, which instructed to whom it may concern that we were Marguerite and Bailey Johnson Jr. from Long Beach, California, en route to Stamps, Arkansas, care of Mrs. Annie Henderson. Our parents had decided to put an end to their calamitous marriage and father shipped us home to his mother. A porter had been charged with our welfare. He got off the train the next day in Arizona and our tickets were pinned to my brother's inside coat pocket. I don't remember much of the trip, but after we reached the segregated Southern part of the journey, things must have looked up. Negro passengers who always traveled with loaded lunch boxes felt sorry for the poor little motherless darlings and plied us with cold fried chicken and potato salad. Years later, I discovered that the United States had been crossed thousands of times by frightened black children traveling alone to their newly affluent parents in Northern cities or back to grandmothers in Southern towns when the urban North reneged on its economic promises. 
The town reacted to us as its inhabitants had reacted to all things new before our coming. It regarded us a while without curiosity, but with caution. And after we were seen to be harmless and children, it closed in around us as a real mother embraces a stranger's child, warmly, but not too familiarly. We lived with our grandmother and uncle in the rear of the store. It was always spoken of with a capital S, which she owned, had owned some 25 years. Early in the century, Mama, we soon stopped calling her grandmother, sold lunches to the sawmen in the lumber yard, East Stamps, and the seed men at the cotton gin, West Stamps. Her crisp meat pies and cool lemonade, when joined to her miraculous ability to be in two places at the same time, assured her business success. From being a mobile lunch counter, she set up a stand between the two points of fiscal interest and supplied the workers' needs for a few years. Then she had the store built in the heart of the Negro area. Over the years, it became the lay center of activities in town. On Saturdays, barbers sat their customers in the shade on the porch of the store and troubadours on their ceaseless crawlings through the South leaned across its benches and sang their sad songs of the Brazos while they played juice harps and cigar box guitars. The formal name of the store was the William Johnson General Merchandise Store. Customers could find food staples, a good variety of colored thread, mash for hogs, corn for chicken, coal oil for lamps, light bulbs for the wealthy, shoestrings, hairdressings, balloons, and flower seeds. Anything not visible had only to be ordered. Until we became familiar enough to belong to the store and it to us, we were locked up in a fun house of things where the attendant had gone home for life. Until I was 13 and left Arkansas for good, the store was my favorite place to be. Alone and empty in the morning, it looked like an unopened present from a stranger. Opening the front doors was pulling the ribbon off the unexpected gift. The light would come in softly. We faced north, easing itself over the shells of mackerel, salmon, tobacco, thread. It fell flat on the big vat of lard, and by noontime during the summer, the grease had softened to a thick soup. Whenever I walked into the store in the afternoon, I sensed it was tired. I alone could hear the slow pulse of its job, half done. But just before bedtime, after numerous people had walked in and out, had argued over their bills, or joked about their neighbors, or just dropped in to give Sister Henderson a hi, y'all, the promise of magic mornings returned to the store and spread itself over the family in washed life waves. And so that's the end of my selection. Thank you, Beth. That was beautiful. Um, we have a couple more seconds. So I just want to add, you said previous to this that you read this particular book because she was a favorite author of yours. But what else brought you to this reading? Uh, well, you know, I'm late in getting into um, African American and Black literature, and so I've I've read a few books, but this one just I don't know. It speaks to my heart. Obviously, I'm not Black, but I think I can relate in some ways. And um, this book is is um, highly recommended from a librarian. That's me. <laughs> okay, no, that's wonderful. And I think the point of reading and doing literature from, um, you know, if it's uh, uh, Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, it is the beauty of the stories that connect all, us all, our humanity, that shared experience. And so that's why we do these readings to acknowledge, you know, the work of um, um, people within the African American community, their contributions, and also so people can understand. Um, different treatments and how people have a different lens and context of how they would do that. And so um, I love that book. That's one of my favorites. So I want to thank you so much, Beth, for reading that one. Thank you. God rest the soul, Maya Angelou. She was just an a, a American treasure. Bless her. Global gem. So thank you. You have a wonderful day. Hey.
Thank right, you. So, thank you. So next we have uh, Robin Pike, and so um, she is going to uh, be discussing uh, what she's going to read with us today, for us today. Robin, hey there. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. You're looking great. <laughs> you too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I try. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about your selection and sure. why you chose it. I am reading The City We Became by N.K. Jemison. Um, she is a, um, a Black woman author. Um, she's also a three-time Hugo Award winner. Um, which if you know about science fiction awards, um, that honor is rare as a woman and even rarer as a person of color. So that is truly a great honor. And I, one of the reasons she is such an acclaimed fantasy and science fiction author is like most well-written science fantasy and fiction, these books are not just a story. They are a social commentary and a political commentary. And this book in particular um, takes a humorous um, and insightful approach on gentrification and how a city loses or gains its soul. Um, so I will be reading a few excerpts from the prologue, um, not to give too much of the story away. Um, and in this uh, book, you will hear some beautiful poetic descriptive language. You will hear it um, from the Black perspective, but um, later in the book with other characters, you will hear it from other people of color, including uh, a Native American woman, Indian woman, um, and how 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 they've been affected by the city as well and this is about new this is a fictionalized new york city by the way um because jemison is from new york okay and when you get to the 30 second mark i'll let you know okay Robert? sure and just as a warning there is swear language in this oh you know people. it's, it's the yeah. work so yeah. it's it's the work it's beautifully written so prologue see what happened was i sing the city fucking city I stand on the rooftop of a building I don't live in and spread my arms and tighten my middle and yell nonsense ululations at this construction site that blocks my view. I'm really sit singing to the cityscape beyond. The city will figure it out. It's dawn. The damp of it makes my jeans feel slimy. Or maybe that's because they haven't been washed in weeks. Got change for a wash and dry? Just not another pair of pants to wear till they're, they're done. Maybe I'll spend it on more pants at the Goodwill down the street instead, but not yet. Not till I finish going, ah, 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 and listening to the syllable echo back at me from every nearby building face. In my head, there's an orchestra playing Ode to Joy with a Buster Rhymes backbeat. My voice is just tying it all together. Shut your fucking mouth, someone yells. So I bow and exit the stage. But with my hand on the doorknob of the rooftop door, I turn and stop and, and frown and listen. Because for a moment, I hear something both distant and intimate singing back at me, basso deep, sort of coy. And from even farther, I hear something else, a dissonant gathering growl. Or maybe those are the rumblers of police sirens. Nothing I like the sound of I either way. I leave. There's a way these things are supposed to work, says Paolo. He's smoking again, nasty bastard. I've never seen him eat. All he uses his mouth for is smoking, drinking coffee, and talking. Shame, it's a nice mouth otherwise. We're sitting in a cafe. I'm sitting with him because he bought me breakfast. The people in the cafe are eyeballing him because he's something not white by their standards, but they can't tell what. They're eyeballing me because I'm definitely black and because the holes in my clothes aren't the fashionable kind. I don't stink, but these people can smell anybody without a trust fund from a mile away. Right, I say, butting into the egg sandwich and dear near wetting myself. Actual egg, Swiss cheese. It's so much better than that McDonald's shit. I'm skipping a little bit. Then a cop comes in. Fat, florid guy buying hipster Joe for himself and his partner in the car and his flat eyes skim the shop. I imagine mirrors around my head, a rotating cylinder of them that causes his gaze to bounce away. 
there's no real power in this. It's just something I do to make myself less afraid when the monsters are near. For the first time though, it sort of works. The cop looks around, but doesn't ping on the lone black face. Lucky, I escape. I paint the city. Back when I was in school, there was an artist who came in on Fridays to give us free lessons in perspective and lighting and other shit that white people go to art school to learn. Except this guy had done that and he was black. I'd never seen a black artist before. For a minute, I thought maybe I could be one too. I can be sometimes. Deep in the night on a rooftop in Chinatown with a spray can for each hand and a bucket of drywall paint that somebody left outside after doing up their living room in lilac, I scuttle, crab like squirrels. The dry stu drywall stuff I can't use too much of. It'll start flaking off after a couple of rains. Spray paint's better for everything, but I like the contrast of the two textures. Liquid black on rough lilac, right, red edging the black. I'm painting a hole. It's like a throat that doesn't start with a mouth or end in lungs. A thing that breathes and swallows endlessly, never filling. I spend the next two days going all over the city, drawing breathing holes everywhere till my paint runs out. That's all I'm going to read. <laughs> I, you're muted. So thank you. We're gonna move on to the next reading, but look at what, um, what did you love about that reading? In particular? I love the personification of the city. Um, and I love the introduction of the characters. You, I, the segment I read, you get to meet the character an unnamed character who you find out later on who that is, as well as Paolo, who is a sort of guide along the tale. Um, so I didn't read much of his Paolo's part, but um, it, it's a great, beautiful interaction um, between the unnamed character and New York City. Thank you so much. I appreciate you reading that because I really love her. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little biased, so uh, thank you so much. You have a wonderful day, and I hope you can come back and listen to some other work that people are doing. I will be tuning in on YouTube. Thank you. Oh, you're so awesome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Have a nice one. Be safe. You too. Thanks. Um, next, we have uh, oh, Dr. Mugindi. Are you here? Anna? Are you here? Oh, Anna. There you are. Here is Anna. Hi. Hey there. How you doing? How are you? I'm good. good. Thank, you. Thank you so much for waiting. Sorry, we're running a little behind. Oh, it's okay. I understand how these functions go. I just want to <laughs> yes, thank you. you. Yes, no, thank you. So uh, talk to us a little bit today about what you're reading and why you decided to read. So I'll be reading The Other West Moore, One Name, Two Fates. Um, and it's a powerful story of two young men who were both named unrelated, both named Wesley Moore, and um, they grew up in Baltimore. Um, I'm reading this story because, first of all, it's so timely um, with the unfortunate and uh, very, very tragic murders of um, Black men at the hands of police. Um, this story was written before we had a similar incident in Baltimore. Um, and also because I was also in the juvenile justice system. It's not something I talk about enough, not out of shame. I just really forget that past um, experience, but I was actually expelled from Dade County, Miami-Dade County public schools. And I also went to juvenile. Um, I went to an alternative school, Jan Man Opportunity School, and it was there that I turned around. So, um, I see myself as two Annas, and so um, this story is one that I gave to my brothers, my nephews, and it, it means a lot to me. I've seen Wes Moore speak several times, and he, um, he, he, his story is compelling. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, and we'll let you know at the 30-second mark, okay? Okay. Yeah, right, thank, thank you for holding space for this also. Um, and thanks to both you and the committee. 
great job oh, tuning okay. in throughout the day. Yeah, yeah, the committee is wonderful. They've done a lot of great work to really get mm -hmm. It was a task, but um, we all did it. And grateful to you and other people who come and share their hearts and, and, and perspectives to enrich this process. Because that's what we do. We listen yep. to each other, and hopefully that will enrich us in a way in which yep. for us to change our behavior, right? Or mm -hmm. give us another perspective. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Awesome. My pleasure. Uh, so I'll be reading the epilogue and then um, another section. Wes has spent every day of his life since 2000 in the Jessup Correctional Institute, a maximum security facility in Maryland. His day begins at 5.30 a.m. He works as a carpenter making desks and tables, and sometimes he makes license plates. He gets paid 53 cents a day, which he can use at the prison commissary to buy toothpaste, snacks, stamps, and other miscellaneous items. Lights go out at 10 p.m. Guards tell him when to wake up, when to eat, when to go to the bathroom. He has two hours for free time a day, outside time, quote unquote, that he can use to play basketball or talk to other inmates. Wes is now a devout Muslim. Initially, he went to Friday mosque services because they were the only opportunity he had to see his brother, Tony, who was also in Jessup but eventually he started to pay attention to the message and decided to learn more. He, was, he is now a leader in the significant Muslim community in the Jessup prison. Wes's family still visits him occasionally, but the visits are not easy on Wes. He is exhaustively searched before being let into the, the visitor's area. J the joy he feels when he is sitting across from a loved one quickly dissipates at the end of the visit as he walks back through the gate to his cell. It hurts him that he has no control over what's happening with his family on the outside. I'm gonna skip a little bit. My sisters are doing very well. Nikki runs her own event planning business in Virginia. Shani graduated from Princeton University in 2001 after which she attended Stanford Law School on a full scholarship. She and her sister live in Los Angeles. Uncle Howard has remained a mentor and guide in my life and was my uh, co-best man along with Justin at my wedding. This is now the author speaking about his life. He lives in Southern New Jersey with my aunt Pam and their two daughters. Despite the difficult time with the death of my, his mother, Justin managed to finish high school strong and received a scholarship to college. Then he goes back to Wes Moore, his uh, peer who is incarcerated. Wes's mother, Mary, works in medical technology, specializing in elder care. She is raising six children, three of Wes's kids her niece, her nephew, and her youngest son. She lives in Aberdeen, Maryland, a little under an hour away from Baltimore. Wes's aunt Nisi has been working for the state of Maryland doing home visits for the elderly, sick and shut in for a decade. Her children live in Maryland and Pennsylvania and her youngest just graduated from high school. All of her children finished high school. Wes's brother, Tony, was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole after he was convicted as the trigger man in the death of Sergeant Prothero. Wes Moore, who was incarcerated, and his brother um, tried to rob, I believe, a bank, and then they killed a police officer um, while they were robbing. Um, so that's how they ended up incarcerated. The death penalty was taken off the table after Tony agreed to cooperate with the state. Sergeant Prethero's sister told Tony as he was leaving the courtroom after sentencing that Bruce stood up, stood for everything that is good in society and you stand for everything that is evil. Never remorseful, Tony coolly replied, saying to you, in March, 2008, Tony died in prison from kidney failure. He was 38 years old. And so now I'll go to Westmore and how his life turned out. So you can see the juxtaposition between um, Westmore, who was not incarcerated, and his family going on to Ivy League schools, and himself being a Rhodes Scholar, Oxford educated, 
uh, Iraq war veteran and um, Westmore who was incarcerated, his family attained high school education um, and is sort of disrupted. So going back to Westmore, Thank as for you, Anna. And just mm -hmm. FYI, it's 30 seconds, but I'll give you a little leeway there because I want you, you, you want to finish this part of it. So uh, actually, that was very good timing because I was coming to the end. Okay. So in my last few seconds, I just want to say that the difference and though the author is very careful not to compare too much, but the difference was a community that stood up in a community that was very present and uh, um, very much intervening all of the forces that would disrupt a young black man's life. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. Perfect time and thank you. Thank you, Anna, and thank you for that piece. I loved Westmore when I was working at Hopkins. I had the opportunity to meet him. I was going to the school and he was there for several of the events. And I bought that book and it made such a profound, um, it touched me um, because it showed the parallel, like you said, the juxtaposition of people, when you give people opportunity, when you give mm -hmm. people a chance, it's the, the, the underpinning of it, the social justice. We live in Baltimore where the schools, you know, are, don't have enough funding because it's a city, at least the city schools. So you can see the poverty, you can see the resilience, but you also can see if we were able to fund people and give them equal opportunity, how much they could contribute to the larger um, society and culture and how much more or better mm -hmm. we would be off better off we would be. I also saw a woman on TV talking about her work and she said, if we got rid of racism, sexism, this country would make millions of billions of dollars. We could really move forward as a culture if we gave people equity to be able to do and, uh, and, and get the things that they need for their survival family, feeding your family, or a career, or an opportunity to go to school and get a job. And so um, I really appreciated his work because it's just, you know, it makes it very clear. Uh, if you give people opportunity and a chance, there's nothing that they cannot do. So that's how mm -hmm. strong the human spirit mm -hmm. is. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I just wanted to say, I thought it was just my audio, but I think you're fading in and out and the uh, audio is very low. Okay. Um, but thank, thank you. you again for holding space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, okay, everybody. So my mic is going down. I am about to switch my duties. It's gonna be Cindy. Cindy is going to be your host this evening. Welcome. I was gonna say the family, Fantasy Island. Uh, Cindy, you're officially a host. <laughs> and uh, you said Mary had to go. Jenny Cotton's the next person up. Uh, what about Brecca? Brecca, uh, is Brecca here? I'm looking at the attendees and I don't see the name. There she is, yes. I think um, Brecca is next. And you can go ahead and you, you have the power to move her into a panelist and I'm gonna mute myself. All righty. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, we're gonna hear from Brecca Faust right now, who is gonna read something from Nikki Giovanni. Brecca, welcome. Hi, I'm trying to turn my camera on. Hold on. Um, I do live in rural Pennsylvania and we don't always have the best bandwidth. So um, and I'm also on my lunch hour. So let me try and turn my camera on and then I'm going to read vote. And then I probably have to get back to work. Okay, you know, as far as the camera goes, whatever you're comfortable with. <laughs> well, I'm trying to, is it, here it comes. Okay, here you are. everybody. Thank you for having me. Today I am reading Vote. Um, Nikki Giovanni wrote this for this um, most recent election that we just had. Um, I chose Nikki Giovanni because um, she is a poet I studied with my fifth grade students in Atlanta, Georgia. She is a real person from Tennessee, just like we were all real people from Georgia, um, which I think reinforces the idea that poetry is about communication and anybody can be a poet and use poetry among other writing forms to document the times and to speak back to the times. Uh, the final thing I wanted to say about vote is that the reading level is very accessible. So this is very exciting because it's extremely profound um, and extremely contemporary, uh, but it can be worked into um, 
pretty much, I would say from third grade through graduate school <laughs> in terms of discussing the meaning. So without further ado, vote by Nikki Giovanni. <clears throat> it's not a hug nor mistletoe at Christmas. It's not a colored egg at Easter nor a bunny hopping across the meadow. It's a vote saying you are a citizen. Though it sometimes is chocolate or sometimes vanilla, it can be a female or a male. It is right or left. I can agree or disagree, but, and this is an important but, I am a citizen. I should be able to vote from prison. I should be able to vote from the battlefield. I should be able to vote when I get a driver's license. I should be able to vote when I can purchase a gun. I must be able to vote if I'm in the hospital, if I'm in the old folks home, if I'm needing a ride to the polling place. I am a citizen. I must be able to vote. Folks were lynched. Folks were shot. Folks communities were gerrymandered. Folks who believed in the Constitution were lied to, burned out, bought and sold because they agreed all men were created equal. Folks vote to make us free. It's not cookies nor cake, but it is the icing that is so sweet. Good for the folks, good for us. And that is Vote by Nikki Giovanni. Rekha, thank you so much. I, uh, I know you introduced it by sort of talking about how and, and why it resonated with you. Um, it, I, you know, I, I, um, as a person who votes, who makes, took my kids to the voting booth when they were little, um, it, it just strikes me as there's so many people who can't vote and you just listed all of them. <laughs> Yeah. And, and two, you know, we have the Civil Rights Act passed to give, um, you know, black communities, or all communities, the right to have voting. That is the essential when it comes to particularly black communities coming out of slavery. And so to be able to vote is to be able to choose your destiny. And so um, that is at the core tenet of the civil rights uh, movement, which is voting rights. And so I thank you so much because, as you stated before, we we understand it's important because of our last two elections, it has been made very clear that your voice is important. Thank you, Brecca. Thank you, Brecca. That was terrific. Oop, yes, I'm unmuted. Uh, now I would like to um, introduce Jenny Cotton. Jenny, you're going to have to tell us what you are going to read. You're a little bit quiet. Okay. Um, I can try unplugging the headphones. Does that, did that improve things? Or can you hear me? Give it a try. I can, we can hear you just faintly. Okay. Can you hear me now? Better. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sure. I'll try to, to project. Um, let me... Uh, Had the link and I will put that in the chat for anybody who wants to see it. Um, so I actually um, steered away from literature a little bit and I picked, uh, this is actually an NPR story um, that I heard on the radio. Um, let's stop that please, it's back darkness. Um, about four years ago and it really stuck with me um and it's something that I think about pretty regularly since um and so I thought I'd share that and maybe it will have a a similar impact on somebody else um wonderful so. we'll let you know at the 30 second mark okay when your time's up okay great um and the title is after making history in space May Jemison works to prime future scientists so at the Oscars this weekend, one spotlight will shine on African-American women in the space race, thanks to the movie Hidden Figures, which is nominated for three Academy Awards, including Best Picture. 
Mae Jemison made history in this field as the first African-American woman in space as part of the crew on the space shuttle Endeavour in 1992. Jemison tells NPR's Ari Shapiro she welcomes this new interest in women and minorities who broke boundaries in space because those people were previously excluded from the narrative. Well, I think it's one of the things that really needs to be done, Jemison said, says, and this is because people of all types have made contributions across the spectrum of the sciences, across the spectrum of space exploration, and they have been left out many times purposefully. And then there are interview highlights um, on being the first African-American woman in space. I always think of it as like, what do you do with your place at the table? If you act just like everyone else, what difference does it make that you're there? And so for me, having grown up on the south side of Chicago, going to the public schools, having been a medical doctor, having worked in Cambodian refugee camps, as well as being an engineer, as well as being someone who was very versed in dance and the arts, Yes, I'm supposed to bring those perspectives to bear on the questions that we ask about space exploration. How do we get more people involved? How do we understand how the various technologies can help benefit people across the world? Those were important things for me, so I was aware of that, yet at the same time, you have a job to do. On encouraging more women and minorities to enter math and science. I think that there are really important things that we have to do with students to get them to succeed in science to go on and stay with careers. And that includes the idea of being exposed to something. So if you know that those things exist, it makes it easier for you to get involved. For example, it helps to know what an engineer is. It helps to know what a biotechnician is, so you're not afraid of it. Hang on just a second. All right, sorry. Um, let's see. Um, my apologies. Then it's experience. When you do hands-on science, you learn to, you learn about electricity by wiring a flashlight, and then it's expectation. And that expectation is we should expect our kids to succeed and to achieve. Children live up or down to our expectations. And so I always call it the three E's, experience, expectation, and exposure. On why efforts to diversify the field have not been more successful. So the efforts to diversify the pool very often are couched in things like, we want them to behave and act like we do, or there are people who get degrees and then they're not included because it's a bevy of things. There's no one single thing. Let me give you the results of a Bayer Corporation survey as part of its Making Science Make Sense program. They surveyed women and minority members of the American Chemical Society. And what was found was that the place where these people had the most discouragement from studying science was in college by a college professor. Over 40% of them had that happen to them. I want to make sure that that future that we're, we're creating is one that is the best it can be for people around the world and also one that includes the full range of our talent and our skills, and you know, gender and ethnicity, geography, to solving the world's problems. And uh, there, ah, uh, that was the, the whole article. Um, A perfect timing, perfect timing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Jenny. Thank you for modeling your, your multitasking skills. <laughs> your, your, your mommy it. tasking skills. <laughs> uh -huh. Sorry. Yes, yes. Um, why did you pick that specifically for today? Um, well, I was... I was thinking about joy and like things that bring us joy and things that like getting to do what we love and Mae Jemison, from what I know about her um, very much seems like somebody who loves what she does and it's wonderful to have that example um, and I think um, like I said I, I heard this on the radio um, almost four years ago now and it really sticks with me and the thing I think that stays with me most is 
you know, when you do have a place at the table, what do you do with it? Like, what do you do to make sure that you're expanding who can be there um, and the ways that they can be there? Like this idea of bringing our entire selves into what we're doing, not just, you know, this is the part of me that does this thing, um, but also like, this is all of my background, this is all of my experience and this influences the way that I look at things and what I can bring to the discussion. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, I also thought it was kind of appropriate for this, just because she mentions that like 40% of the scientists that were mentioned in this survey had been discouraged at the college level from going into science. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yeah, um, I agree with that. The scholar said to first expand the table and then change the table itself. Um, uh, but so like we as people who are involved in the university maybe have some role to play in this um, and try to make sure that that's not happening, that people are encouraged to pursue not just science, but whatever area that they feel called to, that they um, that they have something to contribute to. Um, so uh, that's why I, I picked that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, thanks, Alex Alexis, for uh, putting words to that also. Expand yeah. the table, change the table itself. And working right. for the university, we all have a role to play in that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just want to call out Anastasia Joy Armendariz is recommending some poems by Georgia Douglas Johnson. She's going to have to run off and teach a class. <laughs> um, but you'll see the poems uh, in the chat. And also, I think we ought to put them on the jam board so we can grab those uh, titles. That's awesome. Um, Jenny, thank you. You're welcome. I Thank you for this opportunity. I am now going to introduce Ben Shaw, who we skipped earlier. Ben, thank you for hanging out. I appreciate oh, okay. that. And uh, if you want to tell us about what you're going to read, and then after Ben, we'll hear from Judy. Sure thing. Um, so thank you, Cindy. Uh, thank you, Tahira. Thank you for uh, everyone for having me. Um, I'm going to read a poem from the poet, sociologist, University of Chicago professor, and Marvel comic book writer, Eve Ewing. It's from her collection, Electric Arches, which is a phenomenal book of poetry. And it's based on a Zora Neale Hurston quote, no, I do not weep at the world. I am too busy sharpening my oyster knife. Uh, so the poem is, what I mean when I say I'm sharpening my oyster knife. I mean, I'm here to eat up all the ocean you thought was yours. I mean, I brought my own quarter of a lemon, tart and full of seeds. I mean, I'm a tart, I'm a bad seed. I'm a red handled thing. And if you move your eyes from me, I'll cut the tender place where your fingers meet. I mean, I never met a dish of horseradish I didn't like. I mean, you're a twisted and ugly root and I'm the pungent stinging firmness inside. I mean, I look so good in this hat with a feather and I'm a feather and I'm the heaviest featherweight you know. I mean, you can't spell anything I talk about with that sorry alphabet you have left over from yesterday. I mean, when I see something dull and uneven, barnacled and ruined, I know how to get to its iridescent everything. I mean, I eat them alive. What I mean is I'll eat you alive, slipping the blade in sideways, cutting nothing because the space was always there. Thank you. Ben, thank you for that. That was wonderful. Um, why today for Black Joy? Um, so I chose this poem, first of all, this is a poem I love. Uh, the whole collection is fantastic and I love that poem in particular. Um, but a big reason why I chose that one in particular is that many of the other poems in the collection, uh, which are definitely worth checking out, uh, they deal with feelings of despair or grief, dealing with racism or loss, and that didn't fit the theme of joy. Um, and the context of the Zora Neale Hurston quote 
uh, is explicitly about joy, explicitly about not being defined by other people's perception of your despair. Uh, it's, you can't take away my joy. I'll find something iridescent in every barnacle, nothing. Um, <laughs> and I especially love the last line, cutting nothing, because the space was always there. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, Judy, Judy Markowitz. I am looking, I don't see, Ah, yes, Judy, I'm promoting you to a panelist. Thank you, thank you. And um, Judy is gonna read uh, two readings, one from Elizabeth Alexander and one from Tara Betts. Uh, sorry, you can are. you hear me now? Yes. Actually, I'm, I'm just going to uh, read one. I'm just gonna read one. Okay, I'm gonna read a poem by Tara Betts. I, I never heard of her before. I was looking for something to read. I wasn't sure if I was gonna do poetry or something from a book. And I found this poem written by her and I, I just, I loved it the, the first time I read it. And um, so let me read it. This was first, uh, published in a 2004 volume of Women's Studies Quarterly. It's titled Women Writers Workshop for LK. I had to stop my heart when the gate swung open so I could display identification, walk past cyclone wire and 20 foot fences, step around duck shit while watching ducks flit and sputter on the moat stretched along the length of fence. I approached every week, this routine, this perimeter. Inside the grip of brick and steel chokes a teeming mass of women, Cook County Jail where even heat stifles. I meet women in classrooms with slits for windows. Some posters encourage them to read. Another outlines the 12 step program rules posted everywhere. These women share stories crafted and emptied on hoarded paper with coveted pens. Women who know what it means to trade your body for hunger. Women who was trying to feed their babies. Women who stabbed their man because they couldn't stand his fist drumming on their faces again. Women who just got the GDE, GED. Women who be mothers. Women who be girlfriends and wives. Women who want grilled cheese sandwiches so they press bread on lights overhead. Women who stumble over words they read, who show each other how to say the words, who fill me up with their laughter, who gossip about who did what on the tier. Women who have a wife on the tier. Women who write letters to the boyfriend whose name is tattooed on their neck. Women that you don't ask why they're here. Women who await court dates so they kick through doors like black exploitation flick heroines and Hermanaz de la Raza. So I stop my heartbeat when I see myself in what these women do. My pulse slows down to death inside because I want them to follow me out these doors, these gates, past the ducks, so they can sleep in beds with sheets they choose have the luxury of spending too much time and money at the diner they can walk to when they feel like it. Knowing the wind itself affirms they are beautiful, intelligent, capable as polished steel, bent to architectural perfection, despite what statistics say, in spite of who touched them in unhealed memory, despite arms that should have held them gently. These women rip beating veined flesh from their chests, consider me worthy to look it over and give them advice when they have taught me to be humble. As a tribute for their sacrifice, a shield that damns my tears, I stop my heart from beating for a moment. So that was written in 2004. And she, uh, I read about her, she, uh, in 2010, Essence Magazine named her as one of their 40 favorite poets. She received a BA in communication at Loyola University, an MFA in creative writing from New England College, and a PhD in English creative writing from Binghamton. 
But what I loved about her reading, she encourages literacy and works with art programs. In Chicago, she was an influential educator. She co-founded Girl Speak, a weekly writing leadership workshop for young women. She's also conducted short-term workshops in schools, community centers, Ms. Foundation, City Girls, which is a substance abuse rehabilitation center for teen girls, Cook County Jail and Cook County Juvenile Detention, uh, Detention Center. She's appeared on HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam and Black Family Channel series. Judy, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for sharing about the author. Really a, an amazing person. Um, yeah. Before you go, was there any, like all the lines in that poem were so vivid. You know, each one kind of was a story in itself. So I'm curious, was there one line in particular that really stood out for you? Um, the, there were, you're right, there were just so many. Um, the, the fact that, that she's worked, that they are sharing their writing with her, that they consider her worthy to look it over and give them advice. And I just, I felt like she, in her writing that she was just trying so hard to make things better for them. If, if she could help them with their writing and it somehow when they were released, that that would help them further along. Wonderful. Thank you. That, that fits, with our, fits with our Black joy. Judy, thank you. You're welcome. Um, now we have up next, Shubayan Sahu, who I'm going to promote to panelists. There we go. Hello. Ah, Shubayan. Hi. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh Thank yeah. you. Thank you for hanging out and waiting since we are running behind. I really appreciate that. No problem. I'm very happy and thankful to be participating uh, in Black History Month with you all. Uh, yeah, I'll be reading from Isabel Wilkerson's recent book called Caste, The Origins of Our Discontent. Um, yeah, shall I start? Yes, please. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I, before I start, I, I chose to read this book because uh, it finds a common thread uh, between the persecution of Black Americans, uh, Jews in uh, Nazi Germany, and Dalits in India, where I'm from. Uh, and the common thread is a caste system that uh, rationalizes division among people. Uh, I'll be reading excerpts from only the last chapter of the book, uh, which is a manifesto for what a moral society must do to counter uh, this casteism. Let me start. Uh, in December 1932, one of the smartest men who ever lived landed in America on a steamship with his wife and their 30 pieces of luggage as the Nazis bore down on their homeland of Germany. Albert Einstein, the physicist and Nobel laureate, had managed to escape the Nazis just in time. The, months after, the month after Einstein left, Hitler was appointed chancellor. In America, Einstein was astonished to discover that he had landed in yet another caste system one with a different scapegoat caste and different methods, but with embedded hatreds that were not so unlike the one he had just fled. The worst disease is the treatment of the Negro, he wrote in 1946. Everyone who freshly learns of this state of affairs at a maturer age feels not only the injustice, but the scorn of the principle of the fathers of, who founded the United States that all men are created equal. He could hardly believe that a reasonable man can cling so tenaciously to such a prejudice. The more I feel an American, the more the situation pains me, Einstein wrote. I can escape the feelings of complicity in it only by speaking out. And so he did. He co-chaired a committee to end lynching. He joined the NAACP. He spoke out on behalf of civil rights activists, lent his fame to their cause. He became a passionate ally of the people consigned to the bottom. He hates race prejudice, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote, because as a Jew, he knows what it is. The caste system in America is 400 years old and will not be dismantled by a single law or any one person, no matter how powerful. 
we have seen in the years since the civil rights era that laws like the Voting Rights Act of 1965 can be weakened if there is not the collective will to maintain them. A caste system persists in part because we, each and every one of us, allow it to exist in large and small ways. In our everyday actions, in how we elevate or demean, embrace or exclude on the basis of the meaning attached to people's physical traits. If enough people buy into the lie of natural hierarchy, then it becomes the truth or is assumed to be. Once awakened, we then have a choice. We can be born to the dominant caste, but choose not to dominate. We can be born to a subordinate caste, but resist the box others force upon us. And all of us can sharpen our powers of discernment to see past the external and to value the character of a person rather than demean those who are already marginalized or worship those born to false pedestals. We need not bristle when those deemed subordinate break free, but rejoice that here may be one more human being who can add to their true strengths to humanity. Uh, I'll just end with the last, uh, the last paragraph, if I have some time. You have a minute and a half. All right, okay. In a world without caste, instead of a false swagger over our own tribe or family or ascribed community, we would look upon all of humanity with wonderment, the lithe beauty of an Ethiopian runner, the bravery of a Swedish girl determined to save the planet, the physics defying aerobatics of an African-American Olympian, the brilliance of a composer of Puerto Rican descent who can wrap the history of the founding of America at 144 words a minute. All of those feats should fill us with astonishment at what the species is capable of and gratitude to be alive for this. In a world without caste, being male or female, light or dark, immigrant or native born, would have no bearing on what anyone was perceived as being capable of. In a world without caste, we would all be invested in the well-beings of others in our species, if only for our own survival, and recognize that we are in need of one another more than we have been led to believe. We would join forces with indigenous people around the world raising the alarm, or alarm as fires rage and glaciers melt. We would see that when others suffer, the collective human body is set back from the progression of our species. A world without caste would set everyone free. That's the end of my part. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Shubhayan, very much. Um, so many questions. <laughs> um, why did you think it was important to read this, per this set today? So, uh, yeah, it was not an obviously joyful read, uh, but I feel that uh, it soothes your soul to diagnose the reasons behind what our society ails from and the, and the, and the pure artificialness of the, of the boxes that, that, that have been created by people in power to define uh, what divides us. And, and also it is, uh, and I didn't go over it in this book, but it also talks about how uh, radical empathy can help us in defeating these forces. So I feel that uh, there is joy in diagnosis of the problem and there is joy in finding the way uh, in which we can counter that. So, which is why I felt that it was, this yeah. was important. Yeah, I, yeah, diagnosing the issue, naming the issues. Thank you, thank you for eloquently. Uh, thank you for sharing you. that with us. I appreciate that. Uh, Musa, our next reader, is going to read from James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. And I just need to... I just put on you. Andy. You did? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hello, welcome, and thank you. Thank you for um, sharing with us today. You, you want to tell us who you're reading? Yeah, I'm going to. Uh, is my audio OK? You sound great. Okay. Hi, my name is Musa. My pronouns are he and or him. I'm going to read some fragments from the first essay of the book, The Fire Next Time, by James Baldwin. The essay is a letter that Baldwin writes to his nephew, James. I will not read the whole essay because of the time constraint. I will just pick some fragments from the whole essay. And here is the part I'm going to read. 
Dear James, I have known both of you all your lives, have carried your daddy in my arms and on my shoulders, kissed him and watched him learn to walk. I don't know if you have known anybody from that far back. If you have loved anybody that long, first as an infant, then as a child, then as a man, you gain a strange perspective on time and human pain and effort. Other people cannot see what I see whenever I look into your father's face. For behind your father's face as it is today are all those other faces which are his. Let him laugh and I see a sailor your father does not remember and a house he does not remember, and I hear in his present laughter his laughter as a child. Let him curse, and I remember him falling down the cellar steps and howling, and I remember with pain his tears, which my hand or your grandmother so easily wiped away. But no one's hand can wipe away those tears he sheds invisibly today, which one hears in his laughter and in his speech and in his songs. I know what the world has done to my brother and how narrowly he has survived it. And I know which is much worse. And this is the crime of which I accuse my country and my countrymen and for which neither I nor time nor history will ever forgive them. That they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives and do not know it and do not want to know it. One can be, indeed one must strive to become tough and philosophical concerning destruction and death. For this is what most of mankind has been based at since we have heard of man. But it is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence which constitutes the crime. Well, you were born. Here you came something like 15 years ago. And though your father and mother and grandmother, looking about the streets through which they were carrying you, staring at the walls into which they brought you had every reason to be heavy hearted, yet they were not. For here you were, big gems, named for me. You were a big baby, I was not. Here you were to be loved, to be loved once and forever, to strengthen you against the loveless world. I know how black it looks today. It looked bad that day too. Yes, we are trembling. We have not stopped trembling yet. But if we have, had not loved each other, none of us would have survived. And now we must serve, you must survive because we love you and for the sake of your children and your children's children. This innocent country set you down in a ghetto in which it intended that you should perish. Let me spell out precisely what I mean by that. For the heart of the matter is here and the root of my dispute with my country. You are born where you are born and face the future that you faced because you are black and for no other reason. You are not expected to aspire for excellence. You are expected to make peace with mediocrity. The details and symbols of your life have been deliberately constructed to make you believe what white people say about you. Please try to remember that what they believe as well as what they do and cause you to endure does not testify to your inferiority, but to their inhumanity and fear. Please try to be clear, dear James, about the reality which lies behind the world's acceptance and integration. There is no reason for you to try to become like white people, and there is no basis whatever for that impertinent assumption that they must accept you. The really terrible thing is that you must accept them. And I mean that very seriously. You must accept them and accept them with love. For these innocent people have no other hope. They are still trapped in a history which they do not understand. And until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. They have had to believe for many years that black men are inferior to white men. Many of them indeed know better. But as you will discover, people find it very difficult to act on what they know. To act is to be committed. And to be committed is to be in danger. In this case, the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their identity. Thank you. Ooh. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I, um, the lines about you must survive because we love you really resonated with me, but I'm wondering, uh, you know, what, what was the most compelling for you 
in this this whole letter yeah i think i have an answer in, in my head but i'm not sure how clearly i'll be able to express it so okay. yeah as we might have seen in the whole piece baldwin is rightfully is rightfully angry but he emphasizes on the joy on the love of it but baldwin was actually a double minority he was a black person and also he was homosexual and so the way he suffered in his life it might seem natural that maybe he will be always angry maybe he will seek revenge but in this piece piece he did not and i think that is something common that is in many aspects of the black culture that if you think about jazz it was created first created by slaves maybe who were having a very as miserable life as perhaps you can think of but it is so soothing so perhaps the person who have been oppressed most systematically are the greatest lovers because they know the true meaning of love so that's i guess something that stands out from this piece to me wow thank you thank you for sharing that Thank you. Yes, Baldwin. <clears throat> Baldwin is an American classic. Um, wonderful. And yes, he had that dualism of um, being African American and homosexual. Um, it's kind of like uh, W. E. B. Du Bois said: the problem with the 21st century is the problem of the colored lines. And he introduced that, you know, kind of dualism of marriage, marriage mm. and blackness, and how to marry. We have married them, but also that's a struggle because some of that is a and it, it strikes at the. Um, the core of your profound humanity when you're treated differently. And you have to kind of marry this idea that my country is treating me different because I am, and also that you go out and fight for your country in war, right? So it's that position of you know, where you're at that one knows. So I appreciate it, Baldwin, for that. And thank you, Abdi, for that piece. Thank you. Musa, thank you so very much. I really appreciate your sharing that piece with us. I would like to now invite Joni Floyd. Joni, are you, I know you're here. There you are. Hi, welcome. Welcome to our readathon. I'm very happy to see you. And um, great. You are going to read A Communion of the Spirits African American Quilters, Preservers, and Their Stories. Yes, I am. The whole thing. No, um, I'm reading uh, two excerpts from this uh, wonderful book by Roland Freeman. Uh, and I should say, I'm Joni Floyd. I um, am the curator for Maryland and Historical Collections at University of Maryland. So I had to choose the Marylander. And uh, Roland Freeman is a highly prolific and esteemed documenter of American life and folk traditions. Um, he's especially known for his photography, his uh, uh, photography documentation. And when I get a chance, I can put a link to his work at the Smithsonian um, of his photographs. Uh, but what I was captured, what um, I was really captured by his writings on the meaning of quilts and the magic of African-American women quilters. So this is, this is a guy writing. Uh, so the first excerpt is from his introduction, uh, The Power of Quilts. Studying the world of African-American quilting provided me a unique opportunity to bring together important currents running through my life. There was a richness and complexity to the world of quilting that further justified this attention, evidenced through quilting's remarkable range of cultural roles, its incredible variety of technique and styles, and the ways in which its study defies simple conclusions and generalizations. When I was a child, quilts were special, even magical to me. They could heal and they could curse. They could capture history and affect the future. They could transform pain to celebration. And this is an excerpt from uh, the sort of memoir part uh, chapter two, uh, growing, up, growing Up With Quilts, 1940 to 1973. In March, 1945, when I was eight years old and in the hospital with pneumonia, my grandmother Goldie and my great grandmother Arbia came to visit 
and brought the healing quilt. After covering me with the quilt, my great grandmother lit a candle and started reading from the Bible. My grandmother took out a thermos of tea and was helping me sip it. A young nurse came into the room and with a curious look on her face, inquired about the strange smell. My grandmother ignored her. So the nurse left and soon returned with a doctor and another nurse. The doctor angrily demanded to know what they were feeding me. My grandmother answered, I know what I'm doing. I've been taking care of people for years. The doctor then asked Goldie and Ariba to step outside the room and I could hear them arguing. Then the doctor said he didn't want any of that hoodoo mess in this hospital and asked her to please leave quietly. When they came back into the room, he took the quilt off me and gave it to my grandmother, telling her to take this stinking thing away. She was so mad, I thought she was about to cast a spell on them. But all she said was, if anything happens to my grandson, I'll get all of you. She and Ariba then kissed me and left. It could have been my imagination, but it seemed that just having that quilt on me made me feel better. And that's the end of that excerpt. Whoop, there we go. Joni, that was so powerful. I feel like yes. you know, there was like such protective energy and feelings in that. The power of quilts, the power of family generations, the power of ancestors. And I think quilting, I mean, it's literally and metaphorically uh, a reflection of the African-American culture. It's uh, bring, weaving together uh, disparate elements, uh, which some people regard as trash, but they're woven together into something that is beautiful, that's warm, that's wonderful, and that's functional. Uh, so I, I love that. I love the book because the book itself is like a quilt. Uh, it's a, a collection of stories. It's a collection of his photographs. And it's actually very functional. It is a survey of African-American quilts in the South. Uh, oh. So, cause he's a, he's a curator. He documents uh, quilts and he's a wonderful Marylander. So uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to share it. And I am going to uh, just put a, a, a quick uh, link in the uh, chat and uh, uh, we were speaking of common threads, so so here's another uh, common thread for us. Wonderful, yeah. And folks are asking about the name of the book. I'll do that too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Joni. That's awesome. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I really happy to participate. <laughs> uh, I believe our next reader is Lindsay Inge Carpenter, who's going to read something from Bell Hooks. Um, Lindsay, I might need to promote you to presenter, panelist, pres that would help. Lindsay, there you Hello. are, thank you. All right, yes, I'm going to read um, some excerpts from Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks. I'm gonna read a few of the pas passages from her chapter on engaged pedagogy. To educate as the practice of freedom is a way of teaching that anyone can learn. That learning process comes easiest to those of us who teach, who also believe that there is an aspect of our, of our vocation that is sacred, who believe that our work is not merely to share information, but to share in the intellectual and spiritual growth of our students. To teach in a manner that respects and cares for the souls of our students is essential if we are to provide the necessary conditions where learning can most deeply and intimately begin. Throughout my years as student and professor, I've been most inspired by those teachers who have had the courage to transgress those boundaries that would confine each pupil to a rote assembly line approach to learning. 
Such teachers approach students with the will and desire to respond to our unique beings, even if the situation does not allow the full emergence of a relationship based on mutual recognition. Yet the possibility of such recognition is always present. Paulo Freire and the Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh are two of the teachers who have touched me deeply with their work. When I first began college, Freire's thought gave me the support I needed to challenge the banking system of education, that approach to learning that is rooted in the notion that all students need to do is consume information fed to them by a professor and be able to memorize and store it. Early on, it was Freire's insistence that education could be the practice of freedom that encouraged me to create strategies for what he called con conscientiz <laughs> conscientization in the classroom. Translating that term to critical awareness and engagement, I entered the classrooms with the conviction that it was crucial for me and every other student to be an active participant, not a passive consumer. Education as the practice of freedom was continually undermined by professors who were actively hostile to the notion of student participation. Freire's work affirmed that education can only be liberatory when everyone claims knowledge as a field in which we all labor. That notion of mutual labor was affirmed by Thich Nhat Hanh's philosophy of engaged Buddhism, the focus on practice in conjunction with contemplation. This philosophy was similar to Freire's emphasis on praxis, action and reflection upon the world in order to change it. Progressive, holistic education, engaged pedagogy is more demanding than conventional critical or feminist pedagogy. For unlike those two teaching practices, it emphasizes well-being. That means that teachers must be actively committed to a process of self-actualization that promotes their own well-being if they are to teach in a manner that empowers students. Thich Nhat Hanh emphasized that the practice of a healer, therapist, teacher, or any helping professional should be directed toward his or herself first, because if the helper is unhappy, he or she cannot help many people. In the United States, it is rare that anyone talks about teachers in university settings as healers. And it is even more rare to hear anyone suggest that teachers have any responsibility to be self-actualized individuals. When education is the practice of freedom, students are not the only ones who are asked to share, to confess. Engaged pedagogy does not seek simply to empower students. Any classroom that employs a holistic model of learning will also be a place where teachers grow and are empowered by the process. That empowerment cannot happen if we refuse to be vulnerable while encouraging students to take risks. Professors who expect students to share confessional narratives but who are themselves unwilling to share are exercising power in a manner that could be coercive. In my classrooms, I do not expect students to take any risks that I would not take, to share in any way that I would not share. When professors bring narratives of, of their experiences into classroom discussions, it eliminates the possibility that we can function as all-knowing, silent interrogators. It is often productive if professors take the first risk, linking confessional narratives to academic discussions so as to show how experience can illuminate and enhance our understanding of academic material. But most professors must practice being vulnerable in the classroom, being wholly present in mind, body, and spirit. Professors who embrace the challenge of self-actualization will be better able to create pedagogical practices that engage students, providing them with ways of knowing that enhance their capacity to live fully and deeply. All right, Ms. Lindsay, that was perfect timing. <laughs> Um, I happen to know about you that you are a pedagogy librarian, and yes. so uh, you you chose this passage. Is this what what are you taking from it to inform your your day job? Yeah, I mean, Bell Hooks was the first um, person whose writing I read about pedagogy, and she's remained foundational not just because I was the first person I read, but because every time that I feel stuck in my teaching. It's her writing that I return to. I think she artic articulates a vision for the classroom that is joyful, that shows that the relationship between teacher and student can be productive and fulfilling for both, and that it doesn't need to be confrontational. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate your reasons. It's <laughs> great. <laughs> Thank you for letting me share. Absolutely. Thank you, Lindsay. And next up is uh, Imani. 
Imani Spence, I am promoting you to a panelist. So here you are. Hello. <laughs> Hello. And you're going to share something from Audre Lorde with us. Yes. So I'll be sharing um, the transformation of silence into language and action, which is a paper that she delivered at the Modern Language Association's Lesbian and Literature Panel uh, in Chicago uh, in December of 1977. And I still find that it rings true. I'm going to read an excerpt from it. Um, but I hope that everyone reads the whole thing in their own time. I have come to believe over and over again that what is most important to me must be spoken, made verbal and shared, even at the risk of having it bruised or misunderstood, that the speaking profits me beyond any other effect. I am standing here, a black lesbian poet, and the meaning of all that waits upon the fact that I am still alive and might not have been. Less than two months ago, I was told by two doctors, one female and one male, that I would have to have breast surgery and that there was a 60 to 80% chance that the tumor was malignant. Between that telling and the actual surgery, there was a three week period of the agony of an involuntary reorganization of my entire life. The surgery was completed and the growth was benign. But within those three weeks, I was forced to look upon myself and my living with a harsh and urgent clarity that has left me still shaken, but much stronger. This is a situation faced by many women by some of you here today. Some of what I experienced during that time has helped elucidate for me much of what I feel concerning the transformation of silence into language and action. And becoming forcibly and essentially aware of my mortality and of what I wished and wanted for my life, however short it may be, priorities and omissions became strongly etched in a merciless light. And what I most regretted were my silences. Of what had I ever been afraid? To question or to speak as I believed could have meant pain or death. But we all hurt in so many different ways all the time. And pain will either change or end. Death, on the other hand, is the final silence. And that might be coming quickly now without regard for whether I had ever spoken what needed to be said or had only by betrayed myself into small silences while I planned someday to speak or waited for someone else's words. And I began to recognize a source of power within myself that comes from the knowledge that while it is most desirable not to be afraid, learning to put fear into a perspective gave me great strength. I was going to die, if not sooner than later, whether or not I had ever spoken for myself. My silences had not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. But for every real word spoken, for every attempt I had ever made to speak those truths, those truths for which I am still seeking, I had made contact with other women while we examined the words to fit a world in which we all believed bridging our differences. And it was concern and caring of all those women which gave me strength and enabled me to scrutinize the essentials of my living. The women who sustained me through that period were black and white, old and young, lesbian, bisexual and heterosexual. And we all shared a war against the tyrannies of silence. They all gave me a strength and concern without which I could not have survived intact. Within those weeks of acute fear came the knowledge within the war we are all waging with the forces of death, subtle and otherwise, conscious or not, I am not only a casualty, I am also a warrior. What are the words you do not yet have? What do you need to say? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own until you will sicken and die of them, still in silence? Perhaps for some of you here today, I am the face of one of your fears. Because I am woman, because I am black, because I am lesbian, 
because I am myself, a black woman warrior poet doing my work. Come to ask you, are you doing yours? And of course I am afraid because the transformation of silence into language and action is an act of self-revelation. And that always seems fraught with danger. But my daughter, when I told her of our topic and my difficulty with it said, tell them about how you're never really a whole person if you remain silent, because there's always that one little piece inside of you that wants to be spoken out. And if you keep ignoring it, it gets madder and madder and hotter and hotter. And if you don't speak it out one day, it will just up and punch you in the face, in the mouth from the inside. <laughs> In the cause of silence, each of us draws the face of her own fear. Fear of contempt, of censure or judgment, or recognition, of challenge, of annihilation. But most of all, I think, we fear the visibility without which we cannot truly live. Within this country where racial difference creates a constant, if unspoken, distortion of vision, Black women have, ha have on one hand always been highly visible. And so on the other hand have been rendered invisible through the depersonalization of racism. Even within the women's movement, we have had to fight and still do for that very visibility, which also renders us most vulnerable, our blackness. For to survive in the mouth of this dragon we call America, we have had to learn this first and most vital lesson that we were never meant to survive, not as human beings. And neither were most of you here today, black or not. And that visibility, which makes us most vulnerable is that which also is the source of our greatest strength because the machine will try to grind you into dust anyway, whether or not we speak. We can sit in our corners, mute forever, while our sisters and ourselves are wasted, while our children are distorted and destroyed, while our earth is poisoned. We can sit in our safe corners, mute as bottles, and we will still be no less afraid. That is just an excerpt. Uh, Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, Audrey, uh, so Audrey Lord is just my uh, spirit guide. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and she, like, she also was a librarian, which I felt oh, like I yes. did not know until I decided to, to become a librarian myself. Ah, you're in library school. Yes. Oh, wow. You have to come <laughs> to the Yeah. Come to say hi. It was in the library. Um, we're, you know, we definitely would like to hear um, more from particularly the students of color in the library, in the library school, we haven't had a lot of connections. So it's very nice that you're here. I love Audrey. One of my reasons I became a librarian, um, she was just my guide. Her, she was brave, honest, and, and she did it. She did it because she loved us, right? Yeah. Um, and she was fierce. Who stands up against that level of tyranny, um, up against racism, heterosexism, homophobia? She was everywhere. So yeah. That was a powerful piece. Thank you. I'm such a groupie of hers. Uh, me too. <laughs> <and all> <laughs> me too. I, yeah, in my dream, I would have just sat and read the whole book to everyone. But yeah, uh, I got the chance to share this with you all. And I do encourage everyone to read the entire piece in their own time. And the, sad, the greatest part about her, her, her work is that she's done. But the saddest part of the work is that we're still talking about these things today. It's like, how much change have we saw? And that is the, they keep reminding people who keep saying, oh, we, we're past that, we're past that. Actually, we're not. And so um, that piece that you just read, a reminder that, hmm, why do those things sound familiar? Why are we still talking about that? Because we haven't dealt with that. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. For sure. Thank, thank you. you. Sorry, Cindy. No worries, Tahira. Um, Imani, thank you so much for reading. I am going to hand my my moderator duties over to Jody. Um, we've been sharing hopefully our authors and titles in the chat for everyone uh, so that 
you know, if you're inspired to do some further reading, as Amani mentioned on this, that was just an excerpt. There's so much more to dive into. Um, Jody, you can kick off your, your speaker. Thank you so much for everyone for letting me join you. Uh, it's, it's just been wonderful. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Cindy. Oh, sorry, Tara. Go ahead. No, thank you. And the Jamboard, uh, just reminding folks, so I'll just let you go ahead and do your thing. We haven't said it in a while. You're mu muted, Jody. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> we'll get used to this, uh, this whole Zoom thing eventually, right? Uh, yes, the Jamboard link is in the chat. It's been incredibly fun to watch everybody um, sort of go through and add their reflections and inspirations. It's absolutely beautiful. It's, it's a really good reflection of what's happened throughout today. So thank you for participating in that and please feel free to continue to do so. Uh, next up, we have Anenka Chisholm Edwards and I have to make you a panelist. Hey, Aninka, you should be here hopefully now. <laughs> Can you unmute yourself? Are you here, Aninka? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's so good to see you. <laughs> good to see you too. I'm like, okay, okay, what's the button? All right. <laughs> Right? Every time, every time. Every time, without fail. This has been so awesome. Okay. You are, feel free, feel free to go, go for it whenever you're ready. We, we will oh. let you, we will let you know when the 30 second mark is approaching. You have 30 seconds. All right, seconds. I appreciate that. Cause you know, you start reading, you can start getting into it and then, oh, time is up. What? Oh. And of course, everyone out there is going to enjoy it and they're gonna to wanna to keep going. So um, I'm going to be reading from Toni Morrison, The Source of Self-Regard, so everyone can see it. I'm sure we'll, we'll put, put that somewhere. Um, but this essay is called Academic Whispers. At some time in the late 80s, I began to feel an uneasiness about what seemed to be whispered to me in conversation talking about the place of African-American literature in study. This conversation happened between students and masters of scholarship. It appeared to be a private agreement about the true purpose of the discourse. My unease about this Soto dialogue was exacerbated by the, another blatant one that attacked and suborned the legitimacy of, of African-American literature as a field of study. Both dialogues, the convert one, and the blatant one drove the debates on canon formation. Back in the 80s, I was not eager to think about my anxiety about the shape the debate was taking. The politics of identity versus the politics of identitylessness, sometimes known as universality, because I was not willing to be distracted into the old and sad routine that African-American artists and scholars so often believe themselves forced to undertake. The routine of defending, forever defending, their right to exist. It was a tedious battle, so unoriginal, so innervating, it left no time and no strength for the real work of artists and scholars, which is to refine its own creation and go about their own business. I did not want to watch the billow of another Turiter's red cape designed to provoke and therefore, thereby trick a force from knowing its own power. I chose rather to focus on how to create non-racist yet race-specific literature within an already race-inflected language for readers who have been forced to deal with the assumptions of racial hierarchy. I chose to write as though there was nothing to prove or disprove, as though an unraced world already existed. Not to transcend race or to aspire to some fraudulent universalism, a code word that has come to mean non-Black, but to claim the liberty of my own imagination. For I have never lived, nor has anyone, in a world in which race does not matter. Such a world, a world free of racial hierarchy, is usually imagined or described as a dreamscape, Edenesque, utopian. So remote are the possibilities of its achievement in hopeful language, 
it has been posited as ideal, a condition possible only if accompanied by the Messiah or located in a protected preserve like a wilderness park or in the forests of Faulkner's imagination where the hunting prowess trumps race and class. As an already and always raced writer, I knew that I would not, could not reproduce the master's voice along with his assumptions and the all knowing law of the white father. I wanted to figure out how to manipulate, mutate and control imagistic, imaginistic, sorry, metaphoric language and syntax in order to produce something that could be called literature that is free of the imaginative restraints that the racially inflected language at my disposal imposes on me. I don't mean of course to simply avoid racial slurs and name calling or stereotyping. I mean first to recognize these linguistic strategies then to either employ or deploy them to achieve a counter effect to deactivate their lazy, unearned power, to summon other oppositional powers and liberate what I am able to invent, record, describe and transform from the, the straitjacket a racialized society can and does buckle us into. I insist on writing outside the white gaze, not against it, but in a space where I could be, where I could postulate the humanity writers are always asked to enunciate writing of, about, and within a world committed to racial dominances without employing the linguistic strategies that supported it seemed to me the most urgent, fruitful, challenging work a writer could take on. And that's it. You made perfect. You had 22 seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> that was great, amazing. Great <laughs> that was awesome. like, yes. <laughs> Thank you, and I got, what made you choose this particular reading? What, what inspired you about this? Well, I'm, um, I'm in grad school and this has kind of been what we've been focusing on, you know, the, the power of language, um, how different literacies kind of play a part, how everyone's understanding of, you know, the situation around them uh, is really shaped by the language that we use. And so, um, so it's kind of, it's really been, you know, where, where all my time has been going on my reading. So this really spoke to me in that way. Yeah. Yeah. That is wonderful. Thank you so very much for sharing. We appreciate it very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got all dressed up for you guys. So enjoy. <laughs> but yay. Thanks, like, thanks, thank you. <laughs> thank thank you. All right. Um, that was a good one. I love it. So up next, we have our very own Tahira. She will be reading to us. And oh, there you are. There you are. Hey, I do. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank Definitely. you. I think you're reading I, Ibram Kendi. Is that right? Yes. Uh, stamped. I'm just going to read the prologue, a little bit of it, and then talk about why I bought the book and all that good stuff. Um, so uh, every historian writes in. Can you hear me fine? We can hear you just great. Every story, historian writes in and is impacted by a precise historical moment. My moment, this book's moment, coincides with the televised and untelevised killing of unarmed human beings at the hands of law enforcement officials and with the televised and untelevised life of, of the shooting star of hashtag Black Lives Matter during America's stormiest night. I somehow managed to write this book between the heartbreak of Trayvon Martin and Rika Boyd and Michael Brown and Freddie, Jack Freddie Gray and Charleston Nine and Sandra Bland, heartbreaks that are a product of, of American history, a history of racist ideas as much as this history book of racist ideas is a product of these heartbreaks. Young black men were 21 times more likely to be killed by police officers than their white counterparts before, between 2010 and 2012, according to federal statistics. The under-recorded, under-analyzed racial disparities between female victims of lethal police force may, be, may even, may be even greater. Federal data that the median wealth of white households is a staggering 13 times the median wealth of black households. And black people are five times more likely to be incarcerated than whites. But these statistics should come as no surprise. 
Most Americans are probably aware of the racial disparities in police killings, in wealth, in prisons, in nearly every sector of US society. By racial disparities, I mean how racial groups are not statistically represented according to their population. If black people make up 13.2% of the US population, then black people should make up somewhere close to 13% of, of Americans killed by police. Somehow, close to 13% of Americans sitting in prison, somewhere close to own, owing, owning 13% of American wealth. But today, the United States remain nowhere close to the racial parity. African Americans own 2.7% of the nation's wealth and make up 40% of the incarcerated population. These are racial disparities, and racial disparities are older than the life of the United States. In 2016, the United States is celebrating its 240th birthday, but even before Thomas Jefferson and other founders declared independence, Americans were engaging in a polarized debate over racial disparities, over why they exist and persist, and why white Americans as a group were uh, uh, preposterous more, more than Americans uh, than Black Americans as a group. Historically, there has been three sides to the heated argument. A group we can call segregationists have blamed Black people themselves for the racial disparity. A group we can call anti-racist has pointed to racial discrimination. A group we can call assimilationists have tried to argue for both. Saying that Black people and racial discrimination were to blame for racial disparities. During the ongoing debate over police killings, these three sides of the argument have been on full display. Segregationists have been blaming the recklessness, criminal, criminal behavior of black people who were killed by police officers. Michael Brown was a, was, was a monstrous threatening thief. Therefore, Darren Wilson had reason to fear and kill him. Anti-racists have been blaming the reckless racist behavior on the police. The life of this dark-skinned 18-year-old did not matter to Darren Wilson. Assimilationists have tried to have it both ways. Both Wilson and Brown acted like irresponsible criminals. Listening to these three arguments in recent years has been like listening to the three distinct arguments you will hear throughout Stamp from, beginning, from the beginning. Nearly six centuries, anti-racist ideas have been pitted against two kinds of racist ideas, segregationists and assimilationists. The history of racial ideas that follow in the history of the three distinct voices, segregationists, assimilationists, and anti-racists, and how they each have rationalized racial disparities, arguing why Black... Ah, stupid thing, excuse me. Listening to the um, arguing that whites have remained on the living and winning end while blacks remain on the losing and dying end. The title stamp from the beginning comes from a speech that Mississippi Senator Jefferson Davis gave on the floor of the US Senate on April 12, 1860. The future president of the Confederacy objected to a bill funding black education in DC. The government was not founded by Negroes nor for Negroes, but by white men for white men. Davis lectured his colleagues. The bill was based on the false notion of racial equality, he declared. The inequality of the white, of the white and black races was stamped from the beginning. So um, I'm gonna, yeah. Stop there because I think I hit my five minutes. This <laughs> book is amazing um, and uh, a really wonderful historical read and context to help people understand the framing of race and racism in this country, particularly when you put the three voices in there of the segregationists, assimilationists, um, uh, and uh, anti-racist. Uh, you can see and hear that when people start to talk about or African Americans or people of color. It is the framework for how they understand people who are different. And that's what the stamp is. So I really appreciate this book because it allows you to, if you are 
listening, it allows you to understand that when someone teaches you something about someone else and someone else's culture, whether it be your mother, your teacher, your pastor, you have to step back and think, why are they telling me this and what lens did they come from? And when you think about their lens, you will understand what they truly believe about the so-called others, which are non-white people. And I think that if you can get to the root of that discussion and debate, you can better understand why people practice the racism or microaggressions that we have. And I just uh, um, I can encourage all my colleagues in the library to read it because I think we have been socialized to believe black people have less intelligence, black people have less to give. And that is the um, kind of more on the segregationist slash um, uh, some of the assimilations, but more so in that vein. And I think that's the thing that we need to uh, root out if we're going to really change the culture of not just our library, but of the larger society around recognizing when you are practicing racist ideologies, when you are saying racist things, and um, when you're you know, kind of in the way of progress, forward progress. And the progress is a move beyond the limited understanding of you know, racism. Yes, thank you so much to Hira for sharing that. I agree, this would be a really good read for our libraries. I'm wondering maybe we can, uh, we can get a reading group together for that one, that would be great. Or at least the prologue, because it's a pretty thought long book, but the prologue is really good because it kind of just puts it in a nice box for you and lets you, he, he unpacks what he's going to be covering. And that's the unpacking I think individuals need to do. If you really want to understand if you are um, anti-racist or racist, unpack what you believe. Read the book and unpack what you believe. And then your actions. Because I know in the library, I hear a lot of people talking about anti-racism, but their actions are opposite of that. They're, you know, doing the microaggressions. They're, um, you know, undermining people in terms of their perspective. And then you teach the larger cohort of people how to treat people. So if you get into a room and you see people who are, you know, of all shapes and sizes in that room, and your answer to that is, I treat everyone um, with respect and dignity, you're going to do fine. But if you don't analyze what you've been taught about the others, the people, then you'll just keep practicing. And so I think that's the break up here. We have to unpack that and people have to get serious about examining their, what they believe. And then we can move on to kind of um, the so-called, I wouldn't say a notion, but we can move on to having a discussion about racism and anti-racism. A lot of people who are afraid to talk about it or who have these beliefs, they won't get into a room to be able to you know, talk about what they truly believe. But people can see it by their actions that's where the rubber does not meet the road. But I think that's what people need to start with themselves. What do I believe? And then what have my actions been toward folk, particularly people who don't look like me? And if you really wanna know, colleagues in the library and all around the campus, ask your black colleagues, ask your cisgender colleagues, ask your you know, uh, Hispanic, Latino, women colleagues, what they think about you and your behavior. And you will find out quickly how people understand you and to how you, are projecting what you're understanding uh, in a so-called, we say, unconscious bias. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tahira. We really, really appreciate your reading and also for helping us put together uh, this huge event. Uh, next up, we have Jen Edson, um, or I think that's, well, let me promote you. <laughs> let me promote you, Jen, <laughs> and then we can start. Let's see here. I think you should be a panelist now. Hey, there you are. <laughs> Does it work? Yeah, okay, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. I Should I go ahead and introduce and jump in since we're running a little? Yes, please feel free. Okie dokie. So I... Um, I'm going to read some excerpts from an art history book about the African-American artist, Jacob Lawrence. And I invite you to Google these paintings. I will put the titles of the paintings in the chat later um, when, when my section is over. Um, and I, I really like the art of Jacob Lawrence in terms of his mission and his method of painting the Black experience. And 
I selected um, eight paintings to share and describe with you um, today because I think these eight are really great examples of, of Black joy, in my opinion. And um, he has hundreds of paintings on the Black experience, though. So I really encourage you to check out more of his paintings um, besides the ones that are specifically highlighting Black joy. Um, and I'm also reading from a virtual um, ebook from the Hathi Trust. And the title is Painting Harlem Modern, The Art of Jacob Lawrence by Patricia Hills. He also has art um, related to Harriet Tubman and The Great Migration is his um, most notable series of art. It's 60 paintings. Um, and he, he also confronts the Jim Crow South in his artworks. Um, and the pieces today will be from a series he worked on on and off, which is, this is Harlem. Okay, now I'm going to read. Lawrence's composition impresses us with his aesthetic control of form. Lawrence deploys his colors with consummate skill this was no naive folk painter. These vivid pictures by Lawrence remind us once again of the images that Langston Hughes conjured up in words. Both responded not to the typography of specific streets and landmarks, but to the experience of a peopled place, the cultural geography of home turf. As Lawrence explained in 1973, to Willie Suggs of ABC News. All of my early pictorial content was of the Harlem community where we lived. Since my work is expressionistic, there were no specific buildings or sites that I painted. Mine was an overall expression of Harlem. The street scenes always came from Lawrence's imagination, but were based on recollections and memories of street life and the recognizable types of Harlem. Except when painting his series panels, Lawrence composed these genre scenes of Harlem throughout the late 1930s for exhibitions or for submission to government offices when he was employed by the Federal Arts Project during 1938 to 1939. He then returned to Harlem scenes in 1942 following his Southern sojourn. And I'm skipping forward. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the next excerpt in my scrolling. Okay. The pictures then move outside the narrow confines of kitchen apartments. During the day, children go to school and to daycare if their parents can afford it, while their parents go to work and return home at the end of the day. Weekends are reserved for going to church, as shown in the painting. There are many churches in Harlem. The people are very religious. Through the storefront window of the Church of God, we get a glimpse of the fervor with which some express their faith. One passerby views the service from the street while a woman trudges along the sidewalk, oblivious to the proceedings. Two, three, page 203, we're getting there, okay. So I'm not sure how to mark things more efficiently in this ebook. Um, as Lawrence stepped back into the life of the streets, it is not surprising that he painted Barbershop, a place where men congregated, whether or not they needed a haircut or a shave. He later described the barbershop as vital to the culture and visual kaleidoscope of Harlem. It was inevitable that the barbershop with its daily gatherings of Harlemites, its clippers, 
mirror, razors, the overall pattern and many conversations that took place there was to become the subject of many of my paintings, even now in my imagination, whenever I relive my early years in the Harlem community. The barbershop in both form and content is one of the many scenes that I still see and remember. The barbershop was not just a place for grooming, but a major site of male, black male urban culture where men learned from their elders, heard the news, exchanged gossip, politicized themselves and others, made life decisions, and consolidated their identities as black men. It was a crucial part of their public sphere. Black barbers specialized in barbering techniques for black men. They never had white clients to cope with and few women intruded into the male socializing. In addition to returning to his Harlem street scenes in 1946, Harlem made paintings of the trades, not only barbershop, but also the shoemaker, watchmaker, cabinet maker, steel workers, radio repairs, stenographers, the seamstress, and in 1947, tailors, fitting subjects, as the art historian Lowry Stokes Sims has noted. For servicemen returning from World War II and looking for jobs. As he said in his application for the Guggenheim Fellowship, he intended to continue the record of Negro, Negro contemporary life in America on the basis of his exhaustive study of this material, both in literature and in life. He also painted images that suggest his reactions to his own homecoming from war. Although Gwendolyn Knight, his wife, had visited him when he was stationed in St. Augustine and Boston, and he had managed to obtain leaves to visit New York, there was nothing like the joy of being home permanently. A snapshot taken in 19, 46 of Lawrence and Knight standing on a suburban street with her clutching her fur coat to her neck conveys the pleasure they found in each other's company. And the subjects of his art refer to that satisfaction in being home. In the painting Going Home, 1946, Lawrence emphasizes the overcrowded train with overhead bins jammed with suitcases, people sleeping in the aisles, and a lone serviceman in khakis wedged into a middle compartment. The passengers are all black, which, which suggests a Jim Crow car, but the image suggests the relief of a return from wartime service. The painting, The Lovers, 1946, depicts a man who could be returning, a returning serviceman like Lawrence, cuddling his sweetheart. They sit on the Davenport, listening to the phonograph player beside them. A bottle- Again, You have 30 more seconds, okay? A bottle of whiskey, two shot glasses, cigarettes, and an ashtray rest on the low table in front of them. The man's hat rests on top of the couch cushion, suggesting that he is a visitor. A snake plant occupies the table at one side. A flower pot with a pathos plant hangs down, and a pair of photographs in oval frames rests on the red table. It is a touching moment of courtship, love, and the promise of family life. In the painting, End of the Day, a couple lies in bed, leisurely reading the newspapers. The artist seems to be saying that con connubial bliss depends on such shared moments of quiet companionship. So I won't be able to read a description of um, a few other paintings, but I'll put the names of the paintings in the chat. That would be absolutely wonderful, Jen. And also we dropped a couple of paintings. I don't think they're the ones that you were referring to specifically, but we dropped a couple of more paintings um, on the Jamboard. So please feel free to add to that as well so that people can take a look um, either later or now, <laughs> you know, whenever they have a chance because that would be absolutely wonderful. But thank you so much for reading that. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you, you too. Uh, so next up, we have Rachel Gammons. And Rachel, I'm going to make you a panelist really quick here. All right, Rachel, you should be a panelist. Hey, 
Hey, <laughs> how are you, Rachel? I think you're going to be reading uh, from a feminist manifesto. I am. Thank you so much for um, organizing this event, you and your your fellow committee. Yeah, members. yeah, yeah, definitely. Most most of the uh, credit needs to go to my fellows, but yes, I, I I appreciate it, and thank you so much for reading. Thank you. Um, my we name is. Let you, we will let you know when you have thirty seconds left. Um. Sorry, my name is Rachel and my pronouns are, are she, her, and I am going to be reading from uh, Chimamanda Adichie, Dear Ajuele, or A Feminist Manifesto in 15 Suggestions. This was given to me by my very best friend um, when I was growing my kid, um, and it's written by Chimamanda to a daughter of her friend um, about how to raise a feminist child, so it holds a lot of meaning for me. Um, I'm going to read the 15th suggestion, so the very final one. Teach her about difference. Make difference ordinary. Make difference normal. Teach her not to attach value to difference. And the reason for this is not to be fair or to be nice, but merely to be human and practical, because difference is the reality of our world. And by teaching her about difference, you are equipping her to survive in a diverse world. She must know and understand that people walk different paths in the world and that as long as those paths do no harm to others, they are valid paths that she must respect. Teach her that we do not know, we cannot know everything about life. Both religion and science have space for the things that we do not know and is enough to make peace with that. Teach her never to universalize her own standards or experience. Teach her that standards are for her alone and not for other people. This is the only necessary form of humility, the realization that difference is normal. Tell her that some people are gay and some are not. A little child has two daddies or two mommies because some people just do. Tell her that some people go to mosque and others go to church and others go to different places of worship and still others don't worship at all because that's just the way that it is for some people. You say to her, you like palm oil, but some people don't like palm oil. She says to you, why? You say to her, I don't know. It's just the way the world is. Please note, I'm not suggesting you raise her to be non-judgmental, which is commonly used expression these days and which slightly worries me. The general sentiment behind the idea is a fine one, but non-judgmental can easily devolve into meaning I don't have an opinion about anything or I keep my opinions to myself. And so instead of that, what I hope is this, that she will be full of opinions, that her opinions will come from an informed, humane, and broad-minded place. May she be healthy and happy. May her life be whatever she wants it to be. Do you have a headache after reading all of this? So sorry. Next time, don't ask me how to raise your daughter a feminist. With love, Jimamanda. Oh my goodness. Thank you so very much for sharing that. I kept thinking as you were reading, like, I know that, that, you know, clearly she wrote it for a daughter, but I have um, a couple of nephews who could really, <laughs> really use some of that too. Like, it's applicable, right? Like, like across all of it. What what inspired you about this particular one? Out of, I mean, out of the fifteen, what? Why this one? They're all equally wonderful. I picked this one <laughs> um, because it was the shortest and most compact, and I thought I was going to be able to get through it in this five minutes. But this whole thing is only 65 pages. Um, it's an email that she adapted and expanded to a little bit. Uh, so you can get through the whole thing like in your, your lunch break. I recommend it. Perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you so very much for thank sharing you. that. We really, really appreciate you being here for sure. Awesome. Okay. So next up, we're, we're, we're moving right along now. Uh, we have Gary White and Gary, I think I'm going to make you a panelist here. All right. Hopefully, hopefully you're here. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. Oh, where'd he go? Oh, hang on. I think you got demoted again. <laughs> Just a second. Sorry about that. <laughs> you're back. <laughs> uh, you're muted, though. There we go. Thank and you. I'm, I'm, I'm still learning about Zoom. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? It'll take at least another year. Uh, I think you're going to be reading Langston Hughes for us today. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Well, well, thank you so much for organizing, um, first of all. And I'm Gary White, and my pronouns are he and him. And I'm going to be reading a poem by Langston Hughes um, entitled, Let America Be America Again. Um, um, he wrote this poem in 1935, 
And um, it really speaks to the notion that the American dream has never existed for Blacks and poor people and immigrants and other minority groups. Um, and, uh, but it does convey a sense that the dream is yet to come. And so um, I read this poem many years ago, um, you know, probably in college, um, decades ago. And, um, you know, when the political rhetoric of the last few years popped up, especially the Make America Great um, political tagline, um, it made me recall this poem. And um, so that's why I went and rewrite it. And I think it just really resonates today, even 85 years later. He wrote this in 1935 again. Um, so I'll read this. Uh, I'll go ahead and start reading. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be the great strong land of love, where kings never, where, where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme, that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. I'll let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wealth, but, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. Sorry, my screen is. There's never been equality for me nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor, white, fooled, and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the old, the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the man, of take the pay, of owing everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker sold to the machine. I am the Negro servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry yet today despite the dream, beaten yet today, O oh pioneers. I am the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a serf of kings, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turned, that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home, for I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's glassy lay, and torn from Black America's strand, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free, who said the free? Not me, surely not me. The millions on relief today, the millions shot down when we strike, the millions who have, who have nothing for our pay, for all the dreams we've dreamed, for all the songs we've sung, for all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose, the steel of freedom does not stain. For those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America, oh yes, I say it plain, America was never America to me. And yet, I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the, 
Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. And that's the end. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was absolutely lovely. It's sort of one of those poems that reminds you like, no matter how much work we've done, there's still so much more to do. And it's still going to be different no matter, you know, it, there's still going to be work to do no matter what you're looking at. Or I know. Yeah. I, as I said, 85 years later, I went back and, you know, you breathe it and it just is so rings so true today. So yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Well, thank yeah. you so very thank much you. for sharing that. I appreciate thank it. You. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Okay. So we have one more reader today and that is Julie. Julie, I'm going to promote you to a panelist here. And I think you should be up now and should have the ability to, um, hi, Julie. Thank you so very much for sticking in there. We're running a little bit late, but I really, really appreciate you being here. And I think you're going to read from us from Americana. Is that correct? Yeah, it's kind of a um, surreal follow-up to the poem that we just heard. <laughs> I know, right? I was thinking that. I was like, wow, that's, that's an amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I picked a couple of passages near the end um, around Barack Obama's election. Um, so, yeah. Perfect. Whenever you're ready. Okay. She first read on the internet the breaking news that Barack Obama would give a speech on race in response to the footage of his pastor, and she sent a text to Blaine, who was teaching a class. His reply was yes. Later, watching the speech, Seated between Blaine and Grace on their living room couch, Ifamilu wondered whether Obama was, what Obama was truly thinking and what he would feel as he lay in bed that night when all was quiet and empty. She imagined him, the boy who knew his grandmother was afraid of black men, now a man telling that story to the world to redeem himself. She felt a small sadness at this thought. As Obama spoke, compassionate and cadenced, American flags fluttering behind him, Blaine shifted, sighed, leaned back on the couch. Finally, Blaine said, it's immoral to equate black grievance and white fear like this. It's just immoral. This speech was not done to open up a conversation about race, but actually to close it. He can win only if he avoids race. We all know that, Grace said. But the important thing is to get him into office first. The guy's got to do what he's got to do. At least now this pastor business is closed. And I'm going to skip ahead a couple of pages to the oh, to election night. He doesn't need Virginia, Grace said. And then she screamed, oh my God, Pennsylvania. A graphic had flashed on the television screen, a photo of Barack Obama. He had won the states of Pennsylvania and Ohio. I don't see how McCain can do this now, Nathan said. Paula was sitting next to Ifemalu a short while later when the flash of graphics appeared on the screen. Barack Obama had won the state of Virginia. Oh my God, Paula said, her hand trembling at her mouth. Blaine was sitting straight and still, staring at the television, and then came the deep voice of Keith Olbermann, who Ifemalu had watched so obsessively on MSNBC in the past months, the voice of a searing sparkling liberal rage. Now that voice was saying Barack Obama is projected to be the next president of the United States of America. Blaine was crying, holding Araminta, who was crying, and then holding Ifemalun, squeezing her too tight, and P was hugging Michael, and Grace was hugging Nathan, and Paula was hugging Araminta, and Ifemalu was hugging Grace, and the living room became an altar of disbelieving joy. Her phone beeped with a text from Dyke. I can't believe it. My president is black like me. She read the text a few times, her eyes filling with tears. On television, Barack Obama and Michelle Obama and their two young daughters were walking onto a stage. They were carried by the wind, bathed in incandescent light, victorious and smiling. Young and old, 
rich and poor, Democrat and Republican, Black, White, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, gay, straight, disabled, and not disabled, Americans have sent a message to the world that we have never been just a collection of red states and blue states. We have been asleep. We have been and always will be the United States of America. <laughs> Barack Obama's voice rose and fell, his face solemn, and around him the large and resplendent crowd of the hopeful. A family watched, mesmerized, and there was at that moment nothing that was more beautiful to her, to her than America. <laughs> okay, well that was that kind of took me by surprise. <laughs> Thank you so very much for sharing that. That is, there's been a, a couple of, of comments. It was very incredibly powerful. And I I kind of feel the same way thinking back uh, to that moment when he was first announced as president. And it was just like, I couldn't even imagine, like you could hear the echoes throughout my neighborhood, like just like shouts of absolute joy <laughs> like going up with this. <laughs> First elected, it was amazing. So. Kind of like 11 o'clock Eastern time on Saturday, November, whenever that was. <laughs> <I know. laughs> he was actually the first president I got to vote for, and it was on my birthday. It was like this huge. Oh, that's like, awesome. Oh, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was super, super fun. But uh, thank you so very much for sharing that. Sure. And I think that's that was an important piece to share because it, it ties in so well with, with our theme this year, Black Joy. It's funny. I mean, it was sort of, I didn't, you know, I just remember that there are a lot of these moments in this book where the friends are all talking about things. And I thought, I'm going to read this. I didn't even read it th through before I came on here. So I forgot what was exactly in it. And I think, it, I, I think I got so emotional because we're just so different than that country now. I mean, not different. It's things are different. And we've, like, I feel like that was such an innocent time in a weird sort of way. And like, life is, you know, it's not that easy, I guess, is the thing that struck me when I was reading. And not that that was even easy. Nothing is easy. <laughs> maybe, maybe the things that, that were once hidden are a little bit more highlighted now. They're a little bit more obvious for all of us. Yeah. And, and especially for, for us, you know, white people. Uh, can she put the title of the book in the chat? We can definitely do that. Are you... To hear, are you talking? Yeah, Americana. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Anyway. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you. So I, you know, I don't, I like to think I wasn't, I didn't fall into that trap of like, okay, now we have had, now we have a black president, everything's good, you know? Um, but I think it just throws into relief how, how important that moment was and all those eight years of that presidency and, and just how much more work there is to do. Yeah, definitely. For sure. For sure. Very much. Thank you so very much, Thanks. Julie, for reading. <laughs> really appreciate it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for sure. And thank uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for the uh, and listening and reading um, in the Black History Month Readathon. This is our second annual one, so we're very, very excited. Um, I wanted to take a moment to give an extra special thank you to all of the readers who participated in this event and to all of the readers who tried to participate. And unfortunately, we, we ran out of time. We learned a lot this, this one. Uh, so, so hopefully next one will be better. So thank you so very much for your time. Also, an extra special thank you to the organizers of the event, Tahira Akbar Williams, of course, Cindy Frank, a special extra shout out to Lee Dunwood, who put in so much time and so much effort into this event. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, Kate Maloney, and especially Erin um, Ganoza, thank you so very much for being here. Um, and the entire communications team who was just sort of on this, um, effort. We, we spent so many hours practicing and prepping um, for sure. The IT, IT team with extra special thanks to Duan. Duan, thank you so very much. Uh, you are amazing and you've been here and it's it's been awesome. So thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Cece, Victoria and Sandra, of course, thank you very much to all of them. And to Dean Lim for her continued su support uh, for all of the events that we sort of get into our heads to have. Thank you very much for that. Um, this is, as I mentioned, an annual event. Please join us again next year for more amazing readings. And if you would like to revisit any of the readings or would like to learn more, 
please visit our reading list, uh, which we can drop into the chat here really quick. And I, I would particularly like to um, thank Erin Ganoza, who is moving on um, to greener pastures. Um, and just to thank him for all his work uh, around diversity and inclusion. I remember I started the DII and uh, Aaron Ganoza, I asked him for help and he was right there with Rebecca and Simran. And it was such an honor to have that support from a colleague who at the onset saw that we needed to do some work around anti-black racism and for justice. And so it is, it's, it's really heartbreaking to see that he's uh, going, um, but I understand he has to, um, uh, uh, you know, to lose, lose a colleague um, like him at that caliber, him and his family, it's just, it's going to be rough for us. So Aaron, I thank you for everything you've done for um, not just me, but for the libraries, especially, and uh, talking about and promoting uh, equity for all of us. And you have just been an advocate and a champion, and I respect you and appreciate you. And um, it's just going to be hard to see you go. He has been a, um, a, a soundboard for me quite often. And uh, we've had these wonderful conversations about um, how we would like to be in the world and how we would like our communities and environments to be. And um, so thank you, Erin, uh, wishing you onwards and upwards, you and the family. Yes, definitely a big, big shout out to Erin, um, for sure. Thank you guys. This was a really great event. Really good job. Thanks he for is the person, Erin is the person responsible for all the YouTube uh, content as well. So yes, we are, we are crushed to be losing you for sure, but thank you very much, Erin, for being here. Yeah, and shout out to Sharona too. She's been helping out a lot um, on YouTube as well. But uh, thank yeah, you, Sharona. Yes. I think you know some of the comments coming in have been really, really awesome. I think everybody's really appreciated um, kind of having this opportunity online to connect. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, and we hope to share some of those comments. So hopefully, we can get um, a transcript of the comments just to share with our colleagues. And we will get one from this. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Okay, so I think I think that wraps us up. Is that right, Tahira? Yeah. Yeah, library assembly. You bet. Everybody better go. <laughs> <laughs> that was thank so well. much. That was absolutely wonderful. Uh, thank you, everyone, again for for attending and uh, check out the Jamboard resources and all of that good stuff. And we'll see you again next year. <laughs>